You are listening to Space Boy Universe on the SVU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana. 32, minutes, 21 seconds. Five second tone followed by a one second pause. You are listening to Space Boy Universe. Okay, gang, let's go. 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 Let's go.
Congratulations, you're a winner. You win my admiration. Uh, the uh, answers are The Who, The Beatles, Kinks, Her- uh, Her- Herman's Hermits. Really? Yes, they're part of it. The Trogs, Donovan, and uh, The Animals, and The Rolling Stones. Those were any of those three would have gotten you uh, a correct answer. Now, if you follow our Instagram account, there's a picture. The answer to the picture trivia is the ro- uh, is the Who. So you got the Who. We started out easy. Yeah, we started off easy. So as weeks come in uh, and you just pay attention to Twitter and our Instagram c- account, you'll see those come up. And then, of course, hashtag your answers, and then we'll give the answers on Saturday. And, and uh, you know, maybe at some point we'll give a prize for that. But well, what about that, that one? Well, that one is uh, for anyone who's joined at the beginning of our show and ends with our show, and you get to pick the person who is most deserving of the alien. Tonight's special swag is an alien from X-Files, and there's pictures out there that we've posted. So, you know, it's really cool. you got trivia going on. you got swag night, the, the courtesy of Solana. So if, you tr- uh, if, you're, if you're nice and sweet, Solana might just... Uh, <laughs> Uh, might just give you a reward, uh, some swag that we could send out. So anyway, there you go, Sir Lana. Uh, the uh, first week where we really hit it with our schedule. So next week uh, it starts all over again, and I know you're about to cry. <laughs> I am, but it's nothing to do with Space Boy Universe. Well, you know, Personal I understand. problems. I understand. Or you personally. Oh, okay. As my husband, not sure, a problem. Sure, great. But uh, I appreciate the Actually, candy. you've been a prince this week. So oh, yes, yeah. I think you're trying to get some kind of award. Uh, well, I I won't get any of this cool swag that I've hooked up. Yeah, yeah. you won't get to keep it is what you're saying. No, but it's No, nice. but I have a, a list for you on my Amazon of things. I'm going to get you that are very, very similar. So if you're a good boy. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, what, do you, what do you got uh, for us in, as far as banter this week? Well, banter now will cover all six topics and briefly. <laughs> well, let's start with technology. This is sort of technology. Mm-hmm. I am not the least bit surprised by this because I think Amazon is pretty much making their living off of me personally. So, of course, to find out that Amazon is building one of the largest internal logistics shipping businesses in the world. And they have revealed a 1.5 billion air cargo hub uh, that crosses Cincinnati and Kentucky border. It'll bring 2,000 jobs, according to the journal, Wall Street Journal. So um, what, does that not mean they'll have a, their own planes? Or at least they'll branded planes, you know. In fact, I saw some pictures that had their their own fleet branded. Um, I'm not surprised. They're trying to cut costs wherever they can. And the next step in this evolution for them is to to deliver it themselves. Yeah. Uh, so they're 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 not trying to compete with other logistics providers, but they just want to be a freight forwarder. Mm-hmm. Services that you know, like FedEx and UPS offer. So. They want to eventually offer services both to us and to the outside companies and retailers to put it in direct competition with its current partners, according to Wall Street Journal. But, uh, yeah, go Amazon. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, think about it. Is there ever a day that you do not look at Amazon? No. <laughs> no, there isn't. I mean, the other day I was like looking for these cookies that I've been telling you about, these iced oatmeal cookies, soft cookies, mm-hmm. and uh, I found it on Amazon. Uh, our HEB was out, and I waited and waited. They never restocked. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go on HEB and see – or not HEB, Amazon, and sure enough, they had a box of uh, the cookies I was looking for. What don't they have? Yeah, I mean, My goodness. They have a lot of crazy stuff that you can get, and within – Two or three days, maybe even sooner than that, if you use the one hour express thing. Yeah. So. All right, what you got next? Well, gaming. We talk about gaming a lot, and I don't re- necessarily have anything to read to you about this. Um, mm-hmm. It's just the the latest thing out there that's got everybody in a tizzy is Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. Now, I have watched someone play this all the way through, and it. Just watching someone play it, I was scared. Mm-hmm. And I watched, of course, I watched PewDiePie play it because it just happened to be that, that. I could have easily just watched Markiplier. But, uh, yeah, um, it's 
I don't personally understand how it ties in with the whole Resident Evil game universe, let alone the... the you were saying it takes place in the swamps? It takes place in the Louisiana swamps, and everybody's got a southern accent, kind of like what you're hearing right now, because <laughs> I am also from there. I'm not mm-hmm. from South Louisiana. I'm from North Louisiana, but it's maybe it's similar. But, um, yeah, so there are moments in the game that I'm kind of like, don't... Put turn your back on the door because it seems like it takes advantage of the fact that you're busy with something and mm. something comes up behind you, and uh, they have very accurate accurate mosquitoes really? in this game. They're they're big and they're evil, <laughs> <laughs> just like real mosquitoes down here. Um, something about the family is like I don't know if they're infected or if they're possessed, mm-hmm. but I've noticed there's parts of the game. I hope this doesn't spoil it, where they're bat crap crazy, and there's a moment where they're completely lucid and normal, hmm. and they're like, "Look, find a way to get out. We're trapped here. You got to, you got to find a way to get out." But it's like there's tree monsters, things that come up out of the swamp. Um, hmm. You still got your your, you know, they're undead. Uh, the the monsters, the the uh, boss fights are just I don't know. It's like it's almost like the thing. I was just getting the movie the thing. I was going to say Swamp Thing. Uh, I'm, I'm watching a trailer with the sound off here <laughs> because it, you'll hear it if I don't. Uh, no, I was just thinking of the Swamp Thing when you were describing all this. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, Resident Evil doesn't, uh, you know, spook you because going even back to PlayStation One, you know, when the first Resident Evil came out for that, uh, that was pretty intense. And you know, with games have definitely progressed since then, um, it's amazing what is out there. So I can only imagine how. Yeah, um, I don't. I never followed the games, the previous versions, but obviously, just from some screenshots I've seen from the old games. This is miles apart from, like, your objective, how it's being played. Uh, This is not a cooperative online team thing. It's just you and this game. Mm -hmm. And you do have to solve some puzzles, which don't seem like you have to go here, find this part, and put it in this thing and match it up. But then there's another puzzle I saw where you're watching a videotape. Your, your 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 character in the game is watching a videotape, but you have to play as the character in the video. Okay. But that gives you insight on how to solve that puzzle because later in the game, you will be in that puzzle yourself. Hmm. So it's kind of strange. Um, very, very odd. So and what, so what I think you... there's Easter eggs in it, too, especially at the end, because I guess one of the main characters I think is in the older versions shows up as a rescuer. Hmm. In the, at the end of the game. So what would you rate this game? Is it uh, definitely playable? Uh, I don't know because I don't play these kind of games. Well, I mean, from what you saw in... I think if you like your first-person perspective mm-hmm. games where you can kind of get into it and you want to kind of take your time and get immersed, um, yeah, I think it would might be worth your time. But And, and it's available on Steam Powered on Steam. So that's where that's where I went to look at it. So cool. Okay. Okay. Pop culture time. So here's a link I will share with you in the chat. So find out how much obscure Rick and Morty trivia you know uh, by look watching this video. And this is from AV Club, where you and I are eagerly anticipating the return of Rick and Morty for season oh, three. Oh yeah. And uh, I don't know if we have to go the rest of this year without it or not. Well, I had heard something about there was some internal fighting, and then I heard, no, it's not the case. And so we're, we're still patiently waiting, yes. Um, yeah, I don't see anything about that on this particular article. Uh, this is more of a just a fun thing to keep you occupied till it comes back. So uh, that's just one of these things that, like, we – that – by the time that comes back, and of course, Better Call Saul, I would have forgotten everything we watched because a year or more will have gone by. Mm-hmm. So uh, now onward to music. Music. I thought this was interesting. Depeche Mode will release a new single to confirm their new album release date. All right. So they're going to um, 
Their new album is called Spirit, and it will be released on March 17th. So, and the lead single, let's see, does it, is uh, Where's the Revolution? And I think that's already premiered by the time you and I are talking now. So, uh, you can, I'll just post this link you can read more about it and i think there's an interview you can listen to yeah I'm up, these guys. I'm up for some new depeche mode music it's been a while i can't recall any new depeche mode music i've ever heard i'm like sure said, it's out there but it's, it's been a while but um yeah it's it should be good i do like their you know 80s 90s stuff so of course <laughs> uh this day in hi- uh the history the well, day was February 1st when right. I posted Wednesday. it. So yeah. that would have been Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday was February 1st. And on that day in 1861, Texas secedes from the Union. And this takes place, uh, I guess, around the Civil War? I would think so, because it doesn't the Civil War end in 65, 1865? Mm, somewhere about that point, yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody can correct me if that. So but it's no longer part of the I th- Union. I think this is timely, considering that California wants to secede from the nation. And, uh, w- you know, many times we've uh, uh, belly ached about seceding from the uh, the Union. And have we done it since then? No. We've no. stayed. Uh, so uh, I think California should just... Uh, uh, come to therapy with Texas, and uh, l- let's let's work our issues out. That's all I'm saying on that. <laughs> um, someone in the chat said, um, I'm more of a Spandau Ballet fan. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, how perfect is that song, True, by Spandau Ballet? Or how about Gold? No, True is the, mm. the one. Well, True is the first that one. That is but... the f- fun song to sing when you're alone and you don't want anybody to hear, you know. Well, I like Gold. Gold's okay, but I mean, you're indestructible. Yeah. Remember when we watched Venture Brothers, yeah. and their so quote unquote mom was was talking to them, but she was talking to them in the in true lyrics, mm-hmm. you know, and they're like, "She's lost it." <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sorry, I was taking a drink, and I believe that is all for our preconceived banter. What? I know there was something else that we were... Well, you, you did the trivia oh, uh, thing, so yeah, that covered yeah. history. And then there was a posting that uh, Wikilinks uh, is going to release something about the moon landing is fake. And uh, I guess that was being reported by, um, um, I guess, the what is it, the Dark Matter Radio Network. Uh, um, <laughs> I, and it eludes me with the name of the show that Art created over their album. Dark Matter? Uh, no, but it was Midnight. Somebody help me out in the chat session here. Uh, what's the name of Art's show that was, uh, or still is, on the Dark Matter Radio Network? And I'm waiting for Dennis. any moment. Dennis. Come on, Dennis. You're slacking, Dennis. Come on, Dennis. He's there. He's just... <laughs> it's processing. So any minute... Yeah, so I, I got the article from... Uh, I don't know why I keep wanting to think it's After Dark. It's not... Um, so anyway, the, supposedly there's wiki links, wiki links emails that say that the moon landing was fake. Uh, yeah. Midnight in the desert. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, um, so I don't know, I'm on the fence on this, so it'll be interesting to see what emails get leaked out this week, if any, in regards to the moon landing. And um, and speaking of the moon, I can't wait until next week when we talk to uh, uh, Preston Dennett. Um, oh, wow. And, and, you didn't tell them. Well, yeah. It's on his schedule. Well, I mean, mm. in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah, it's on the website. I forget. Yeah, yeah we posted all the, the new shows for this month, and uh, so we're good we're to go. We're going to talk about moon conspiracies with Preston Dennett, which is – he's a fun guy. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I know there's a couple more minutes, but I'm ready to just get this over with. So, you know, let's go <laughs> ahead and <laughs> get – You to, mean this part over Yes, it, uh, because uh, I am excited because tonight is our guest – is Dennis? Uh, it's well. Dennis is watching us. Uh, <laughs> Someday I hope for Dennis to be a guest. That but, would be a, g- a great. No, guest. I really yeah. do hope for that. Yeah. So. so, but no. Tonight our guest is Daryl Sims, mm. the Alien Hunter. Uh, I am just so jazzed about this. You know, this guy's very different. Uh, I'm going to apologize in, in advance. That Stop if I, fanboying over I'm, there. <laughs> I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But uh, you know, and so, you're talking to another Texan. That's what you're. Yeah, oh about. yeah. So yeah, it's it's nice to talk to a fellow Texan. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and play the music. And Serlana's going to get uh, 
Get him back on Mr. the horn. Mr. Sims on the horn, and uh, we'll be right back after this. The Alien Hunter is the world's leading expert on alien abductions. His 38-plus years of field research has focused on physical evidence and led to his groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants and alien fluorescence. As a former military police officer and CIA operative, Sims has a unique insight to the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. Sims is also a compassionate and skilled therapist who has helped hundreds of alien experiencers all over the world come to terms with what they have witnessed. He currently works as a licensed private investigator here in Houston, Texas. Please welcome Daryl Sims. Welcome. Well, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Well, we're excited to have you on tonight, and uh, we have many questions and many things to talk about, and uh, so uh, let's get started, shall we? Yes, sir. All right. So, um, Daryl, um, you, uh, I guess, have been, let's just get right into the meat and potatoes here. 
Uh, you were an abductee starting as a young uh, kid. I guess it was about the age of four, correct? That is correct. That was. Uh, people often ask me how I got into this, and I said, well, it, it actually it was a captive audience. <laughs> I didn't really have any choice. I just a little boy happened to be in my room at night and <clears throat> in uh, 1005 South K Street in 1952 in Midland, Texas. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the truth of the story was uh, I, I opened my eyes because I felt something was wrong in the room, a skill that I've retained with me since uh, I was in a surgery one time, and uh, I sensed something was wrong in the room in the surgery, and I opened my eyes while I was under a general anesthetic, and uh, it scared the anesthesiologist half to death. And I thought that messed up and uh, realized there's another doctor in there doing the work, and I, I had never authorized him to be there. So it's a skill I apparently have brought with me ever since that childhood event. But uh, something was wrong in the room, and I opened my eyes, and I'm laying in bed. And, of course, I don't realize this at the time, but he had just brought me back. He was leaving, walking toward the wall, and I couldn't, first of all, figure out what in the world to think. Why was the guy in my room? Why did he not have any clothes on? <laughs> And why was he so skinny? And it's winter. I mean, I'm freezing. It's I've got my little quilts on and everything, but it's cold. And he didn't have clothes on. He's walking toward the wall like he's going to bump into it. And uh, at, at, I, when I'm thinking this, unbeknownst to me, he's hearing everything I'm thinking. So oh. apparently, telepathically, he could hear that. And he turned around, and then I heard something I had never heard before. I heard him say something without his mouth moving. He said, it's awake. Mm. And he met me. Mm. Now, so right. that was kind of a, a shocker. <laughs> I was not prepared for any of this. Now, you were saying... The aliens that... and things like that back then in 1952, there was no such creature and nobody knew anything about it. Actually, the events had been going on with other people, but nobody knew how to categorize this stuff. So uh, you just, uh, as I did, most people just kept it quiet and... You just act like it never happened. Now, you refer to him as a he. Um, now, I, I've read and, or well, so I've seen some of your uh, your interviews and your, your public speaking engagements. Um, you refer to it not having private parts. How, how were you able to tell it was a he? Or do they have gender? Uh, or gender. That's uh, it's a really good point, and uh, it was something that stunned me. I even figured part of this out as best I could at four years old when I realized when he didn't have any clothes on, he turned around, and when he looked at me, I, he he didn't. Uh, well, little kids see things differently than other people. Right. And the first thing he noticed that people don't have any clothes on. You notice things about them, like he didn't have a tt. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a belly button. He did, he wasn't made like me at all. He had large black eyes that were perfectly round, not the elliptical wraparound types that you see in Hollyweird, but just perfectly round, inch and a half uh, eyes that were just, uh, it, just literally hypnotic. And uh, I'm sitting there watching this skinny, spindly thing about four foot tall looking at me, and I can't figure out what in the what's wrong with him. Why doesn't he... How did like how did you go to the bathroom? You know, little things like that kids think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after thirty eight years of investigating, I've finally put together a few things about him that make a lot more sense. And one of them is, in fact, um, that the reason he doesn't have a genitalia is because he doesn't procreate. Right. A second possibility uh, in that scenario is since he didn't have a belly button or navel, he. He wasn't born. He was hatched, cloned, manufactured, or made for some particular purpose. And the last thing that I noticed is he didn't have mammary glands or nipples or anything like that, like a little, like like people do. And I, I couldn't figure any of this out. None of it made any sense to me. But um, after you think about it a little bit, it, it makes a ton of sense. It, that whatever it is, you can't assign human uh human information to something that is non-human. That's like uh, saying that a, uh, a praying mantis out there in the in the woods, uh, you find a little praying mantis out there, well, it's it's human because, look, it's kind of got a head kind of like ours, little legs kind of like ours. Uh, it, that, that doesn't really work. So it's just a category all in itself. 
and I'd never seen anything like it, and I didn't know what in the world we were looking at. Well, could you put it in a category if you had to? I mean, you know, we, we're used to hearing about, you know, quote-unquote gray types. I mean, or is this something completely different? I can put it in a category because, uh, number one, I've seen other entities, and uh, I had about 10 events over a period of 13 years. My events ended violently at age 17, and that ended it for me uh, uh, personally. Um, but I, uh, I've got the 1,900 cases now worldwide, and the last case I had is in India. I did a surgery, I conducted a surgery in India on a, a lead alien implant. My point is that I've uh, been able to put together a lot of information, and uh, some of it uh, pretty succinct information ab about the phenomena. And the easiest way to describe this to your listeners is that uh, imagine the little gray alien, the little short guy with large bulbous head with large large black eyes, many times a little wraparound type, but mine weren't. But basically they're the same models. That some people call them, the, the, what I'm fixing to describe is about seven entities, and these entities are not, in my opinion, they're entities and they are not races of aliens at all. They're simply models. Yes. And, uh, the example I give here is that the little gray alien, about three or four foot tall, some of them are even shorter, uh, has an IQ of about 80, and uh, that upsets some people when I say that. They say, you're picking on them. I said, no, I'm not picking on them. I'm telling you that I'm giving you a piece of information you don't know anything about. I said, if you haven't been there, you don't have a clue. You're just guessing or you're reading material, and you don't know whether it's accurate or not. If you want to know if something's accurate, talk to a witness. So the second entity that uh, you see in the li and I call the usual suspects lineup is a, uh, a one that looks just like him, but he's taller and he's a lot smarter. He's about, got an IQ of about 140. Mm -hmm. He's often referred to as the doctor, and he looks just like the other one, but taller and smarter. Then you've got a praying mantis type being, which looks like something ranging anywhere from five to seven, seven and a half foot tall. Uh, they are extremely intelligent, probably an IQ of 180. And then you've got this reptile guy, which is very mean, um, really nasty little guy. Uh, some of these characters uh, are very smart, too, but they're very mean. And uh, then you've got another entity referred to uh, as by some people as a Nordic or a human being type entity. And... Uh, they often get credit for being like uh, the wonderful Nordics helping us out and saving the planet and fixing the ozone hole and all that. The only problem with that whole mentality for me is the the fact, number one, there are other kinds of entities that are human-like, and they don't have blonde hair. They have red hair. They have uh, black hair. Uh, but these here, in particular, have blonde hair, and uh, they're sometimes referred to as the Nordic alien. But again, I'm I'm suggesting these are models, and I'll explain that in a moment if you want me to. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the four, next entity in the lineup of the usual suspects is something called Bigfoot. Now, he is a, an entity that is simian or ape-like, very large. And uh, anyway, I'll talk more about him if you want later. But uh, mm -hmm. basically, those are the primary guys that show up in the literature, the primary ones. And in my opinion, they are, in fact, models and not aliens from other worlds. Now, you say they, they seem to come out like new car models. Thank you. Now, you go to the Chevy market and go down there, and you can get a, a little Chevette, or you can get a Corvette Stingray or something like that. But what you're looking at is the, the little gray is kind of like a little Chevette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of the lower-end models. And then you've got that Corvette Stingray on the other end, that, uh, like the Nordic, that, uh, wow, that thing's really impressive. So they, they're definitely tinkering with, I don't know if they have DNA like we have or whatever it is, however it is they're changing their physical being because they're, maybe they're not born, but so, and I, the literature I read about what you said is that um, they need us, they need something from us for to help them, and they've got some agenda, but we're not a part of the end result of their agenda. I think that's a, a, a pretty fair assessment. I really do. Um, the uh, I think uh, one of the ways I can help explain that a little bit is to give you to answer the first part of your, your statement, which I thought was brilliant, and that is that uh, we don't know kind of what DNA they have. We kind of do in one sense of the word. We, I mean, it's not what we can necessarily prove definitively, 
but we do have some physical evidence of that. But uh, more, more to the generic point of view, if uh, if you're you're a witness to a, a, an accident or a, a scene of murder or a, a crime, a kidnapping, and this bad guy kidnaps this little baby or something like that, the first thing you want to do is look and see if you can identify him. Well, if he's if you identify him and he's seven and a half foot tall, he's got the head of a praying mantis. You might assume that probably that DNA didn't come from outer space. It came probably from planet Earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, where are you going to go in outer space to find a praying mantis? That's what I was wondering. Probably how did the get look like that? Where are you going to find a reptile entity? Probably the reptiles you're going to find on planet Earth. Where are you going to find a human uh, DNA, so to speak, for, to make a uh, Nordic? Probably planet Earth. I'm just saying that Probably Mars and a few other places, you're not going to have a whole lot of DNA like that laying around. So in my opinion, someone came here originally, picked up the DNA they needed, made, hatched, clone, or manufactured certain entities, models, if you will, and instructed them, either they believe it themselves or they, are, uh, or, or they have the cover story, that you're aliens from other planets, and this is the, this is the way it's going to be. And that's the story they're going to tell you. The problem is there's not the slightest shred of evidence to support it, not even a little. Right. But I'm intrigued by, you know, you, you listed the different types of races, and it that really seems to jive with a lot of the, the previous research I've done with the different the different ones out there. But it almost sounds like that they've got a cast that does the work, and then the people that – watch over them tell them what to do and then maybe the mantis seems like they're even above that i don't know if they're related in, in all this all this work that they do they do seem to be uh interactive uh but only at certain levels it depends on what program you're in and what program they're running on that individual there for the audience there are two primary um structures that are presented to human beings that are taken um, one of them is called an abductee, and the other one's called a contactee. A contactee, uh, to make this uh, pretty simplistic and, and, and fairly easy to, to divide this thing up so it makes sense, instead of uh, it being real complicated, <clears throat> the simplest way to think about it is the people who get taken fall into two categories, contactees and abductees. A contactee is a person who goes along with the idea and feels like they're here to either save the planet, fix the ozone hole, or it was okay that they took me, and they must know what they're doing since they're a lot smarter than I am. Uh, Native American Indians kind of thought certain things like that about white people when they first showed up in those ships, you know. That didn't work out very well. Not well at all. Uh, just because somebody's got better tech than you doesn't mean that it's good, you're going to be better off for it. In fact, there's probably a good indication you're going to end up uh, on the bad end of the stick. So <clears throat> the... Uh, Excuse me. The uh, the entities themselves, um, and if, if I can get back to my point here, um, these um, the entities themselves fall in the, when they capture these people. They fall in two categories. Contactees are people who like it basically, or think they do, and or, or, or fall under an alien Stockholm syndrome, and they fall in love with their captors, so to speak. Uh, I call them the honeybees. Honeybee is. Uh, is a person who thinks the funny little man in the white suit out there with large black eyes stealing your honey is probably supposed to be doing that. Bees don't know any better. They just keep making honey thinking it's okay. He's been here before. He's always done this. So therefore, it's okay. Not knowing what the world he's doing with honey, why he needs your honey, and why are you <laughs> giving him whatever he wants for that question? On the other hand, there's another group of people, people like me, that were taken, and they were they were simply kidnapped. And that's called an abductee, taken against their will or abducted. And these people are not real happy about the event, and, and uh, they would uh, like some payback in some form or another. Uh, mine is I'd like to capture one of these little guys, and have come close to it on three occasions. But an abductee, basically, I refer to as a killer bee. By that, I don't mean he kills people. I simply mean that if you come to steal his honey, you're probably going to get stung. You're more aggressive about bad. protecting the honey. You're going to protect your honey, whatever that is. 
and honey is whatever it is the alien's after that you probably, as an abductee or a contactee, probably don't have a clue about. You think you do, but you probably don't. Yeah, that's that's something that intrigued me is um, you talked about them implanting the false memories or screensavers, as you put it. And what intrigued me about that is because uh, you you'd had the obviously you had the the non enlightening you know touchy feeling encounters you had the um, violent ones and negative ones but why and you point this out why would they go to so much trouble and bother to hide what they're doing if we're just lab rats if they're just getting us for whatever they need us for I mean who are we going to tell that may take us seriously are they trying to hide from maybe they're trying to hide from you now or why do they go to such lengths to put all these false memories in well, originally, the, it was, in, when I was a boy, as an example, 1950s and 60s, most people did not remember their events. They were very rare that, that people remembered. Betty and Barney Hill is a good example. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had to go under hypnosis. They knew something was wrong. They knew they had missing time. They knew something was dreadfully wrong. And then, of course, they found out, and it was just, just they were mortified. I mean, just, well, how can this be? My events were conscious. I have not had hypnosis for them, and much of the information I do remember consciously. My point is that things were so traumatic for me uh, in my particular event that I, I did remember it, and I did, I did want to remember it. Now, one thing that they tried to do, the entity tried to do whenever he saw, whenever I heard him make the statement, it's awake. Um I was not paralyzed. I was not afraid. I wasn't anything. I, I mean, I'd, I'd watch monster movies and stuff. I didn't even know what, what this thing was. I just couldn't figure out why the little guy didn't have any clothes on. You know, he's freezing. <laughs> he's got to be. And he's not even cold, apparently. And then at that point, his eyes began to move. To There was some little small movement in his eyes. There was an ambient light in the room. People might ask, how could you see in the dark? I, it wasn't in the dark. There was a light on our little well house out there that shone through my window and uh, there was enough ambient light in the room, I could easily see him, easily. If it had any hair, I could have seen him on his head, but he had no hair. <clears throat> so the point is that his eye did some kind of movement, and there seemed to be a little red edge at the, on, the, on his eye, and I couldn't figure out what, you know, what, what, how can that be? At that instant, I became paralyzed with the most, um, most horrifying fear that I, 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 never knew any, I never knew fear like that. I didn't know that could exist. And what I, I've known after now, after many years of investigating, I know a lot more about what actually goes on instead of being a victim. And basically what that means is that the, um, the guy uh, has transferred his fear to me. Mm-hmm. They live in a society you can scarcely imagine. Again, we tre- keep trying to put humanistic ideas on what they are. The, they don't li- the, the, the concept... Uh, freedom and self-choice and all that are completely alien in every sense of the word to them. Mm-hmm. And in fact, your thinking is considered an infestation. It would never be considered. It, they could not survive it. So the the thing that uh, the the thing that happened to me, I wanted to relate to you, is that the screen memory that he gave me with when he moved forward toward me. At that point, when I became paralyzed, when he transferred his fear to me, of course, I didn't know at the time what that was, only that I was scared out of my wits and I couldn't move. When he started moving toward me, I mean, I really got scared. I was like, what's he going to do to me? And uh, I pushed with my against the wall with my little, my, my little, had a little small bed, like a cot, you know, wasn't much. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I pushed the bed apart, it pushed apart from the wall and it made like a V and I, my head fell and, and, and I wrapped up in my covers, and I fell to the floor. Uh, part of me, uh, my hips and legs still up in the on the kind of on the bed, and the other part of me laying on, on the floor. And then the worst thing could ever happen to a kid, the worst nightmare you could ever have. And I was completely awake. There's no nightmare at all. He couldn't get to me that way, so he goes over to the edge of the bed and lifts up my covers and looks at me. And of course, I see that large bald head with large black eyes right next to my face at that point. Hmm. And he changed. Uh, and people say, well, that's because they shapeshift. No, you're applying things to them that ne- is not necessarily true. He changed my visualization of what he was into a clown, a hor- horrific clown. 
Many abductees have clown phobias and have no idea why. I can give you a good example of why. Because that's what he wanted me to remember him as, and I kept shaking my little head back and forth, no, 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 no. I wanted to remember him for what he was, not for what he wanted me to think he was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a bad dream. Do you happen to know why you were chosen or there was something about you that they needed specifically, even at four years old? Uh, I had no clue about any of this uh, as a kid. All I knew is that uh, it, it, as I was telling a, uh, some hot shot one night, was asked a bunch of questions to me. Uh, he says, well, there's stuff we can do. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, look, if I, if I can resist at four years old, you can figure out something at 40. Give me a break. If they're not all powerful. They're not godlike or anything like that. Far from it. I said, the point is, that you can resist, and there are things that you can do. And I said, there, there's a, a plethora of things that you can do, and we found new, numerous things that ha do have some direct effect on them, even on a conscious or unconscious level. But as to purpose, that's a, that's a very good question. That's a $64,000 question, really. And what is the purpose? Why are they, what do they really want? Well, what they often... Well, the reason you have so many researchers out there that think they know what they're doing uh, <laughs> is they don't know what they're doing, and the aliens got them completely hoodwinked. And one of my people asked me one time, says, what do you mean? I said, well, they're being spoon-fed. I said, what do you mean? I said, they operate like an intelligence community. Do you really think the CIA, the Mossad, or KGB, or anybody else in the intelligence business is going to sit there and tell you the truth? They're going to tell you what is called a cover story. It's going. To, they're going to give you what you need to support that cover story. Say, so, well, you found alien implants. You found this. You found that. Yes, that's all true. But you still have to be careful about what you discover, especially in hypnosis, or especially when they tell you people tell you things, because some of this information is beautifully spoon-fed to make you buy into a, a narrative that's not not the real story. Yes, it is happening. Yes, that did happen. Yes, they did do this, and they did do that. Uh, well, they're doing all these medical procedures on people. If you study the so-called medical procedures, I can assure you, you're going to find out if you have any kind of medical education whatsoever in this or have to talk to medical people that see this in, de in, de in detail, you're going to quickly come to the conclusion it's more like mutilation or torture than it is so-called uh, medical examination. I can give you my own example to my own self at age 12 on board a craft, and there was this, this information came to me, pr proof of it, uh, through the, the VA hospital. My point is simply that whatever you think they're doing, uh, if it's easy for you to figure out, read, and get all of it, you probably already missed it. Mm -hmm. They're not... If they're operating like an intelligence committee, what thinks anybody? <laughs> what does anybody think that? Oh, I read it on the internet, so I know it's true now. <laughs> <laughs> really? Good luck with your research. <laughs> well, Daryl, let's hold up here because we're at uh, close to the top of the hour, and uh, we want to get a break and get you back on. So you're listening to uh, Space Boy Universe on the SBU Network. So don't go anywhere. You are listening to Space Boy Universe on the SBU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana.
You know, it's always a fun show because, you know, when we have a great guest on, and our guest tonight is Daryl Sims, uh, we have a tendency to talk behind the scenes because, you know, it's uh, it's always awesome to have somebody of Daryl's caliber come on our show. And, uh, you know, it's just so hopefully we can get a lot of the stuff that we're talking into the show. But, uh, you know, I want to just step back for a second, uh, Daryl, and I, t- I tend to recall when you were a young man, that you were out hunting and you had an, an abduction experience during hunting. Was that true when you had, a, I guess, a twenty two rifle or something like that? That is correct. Now, my question to that is that uh, knowing all the experiences you have had, did you try to, you know, point the rifle at them or to, you know, to spook them off? Or did you just like, okay, it's happening again. Might as well just go with the flow kind of thing. Uh, what happened in that situation? <clears throat> it um, was a fascinating situation and uh, <laughs> strains at my credibility. <laughs> I'll tell you, to, to a psychologist, they would really have some problems with this one. I'm in school on Friday afternoon in uh a little physics class, what I call physics, a physical science class. <clears throat> and I hear this um, message to go out into the desert. And the the compelling for me to leave that school at that exact moment and go out in the desert was absolutely overwhelming. The, the, the message was so clear that I went over to the window in the second story red brick building looked out and saw clouds and stuff and beautiful blue sky and kept wondering where in the world did that come from? Nobody else heard it. I mean, nobody's moving around acting like who said that. And I, and, but the, the feeling I, I had to do it with all my being had to force myself not to go out into the desert, like an obedient, good little boy in school and begging parents. I didn't. However, the next morning, I grabbed my little twenty-two rifle, went out in the <laughs> desert, and got abducted. <laughs> just took a little while to get me out there. So I was out in the desert doing my thing, you know, just looking, hunting rabbits and things, you know, things I always did when I was a little kid out there. And to my shock and amazement, um, all of a sudden I noticed that, again, I, I, I opened my eyes at the wrong time. And when I say that, I mean I'm standing out in the desert with my 22 rifle loaded, 17 rounds in it, and my eyes are open. And I can't figure out, well, why am I standing here in a hot sun, not moving? It, that makes no sense. And I'm really, you know, hot. When you stand in the hot sun in the desert in one place without moving, not getting any wind, any air over you or anything, you get real hot. I mean, it, you notice that you're you're getting hot. Right, And I've been there apparently for a little while, and as I opened my eyes, I looked up and saw the entity, the same cosmic skinhead that always got me before, is now walking away from me. He's about 60 feet away. And I'm like, what in the world? And at that point, he turned around. He heard me think. And uh, he realized at that point I had a gun, and he knew I could shoot him. And I could have easily. So he started running. And as he ran, uh, it started going through the brush and everything. Uh, he finally got away from me. I, I couldn't, uh, I lost him. And I couldn't figure out why, because, I mean, I could I could outrun the guy. And uh, I, I just couldn't figure out why I couldn't get close enough to him. And it didn't occur to me, I didn't know, that they could beam that guy out whenever they needed to. And they did, apparently did. And I went around, I even went out later uh, and looking, you know, think, looking for some little underground bunker or something he hid in, but there's nothing out there. And um, I had no interest in shooting it. I was, I'm, I'm not a violent guy. I didn't didn't want to harm it or anything like that. But I, I mean, I defended myself, but I had no interest in shooting it. Um, so anyway, that was a that was a very weird, weird, weird scenario. At that point, I also realized they make mistakes. And they can be caught. They're fallible, you say, that you can trap them. Yes, they are. They they make it. Look, if you've got an IQ of 80 and somebody sends you to do a, a, a job like kidnapping, do you think you might be able to make a mistake or two? Oh, Half yeah. the time, they can't even get your clothes on right. Or put on They get your clothes, clothes on inside out. You and your wife go, 
go go to sleep and, and you end up abducted or something, come back and you'll end up with her clothes on, her or, or vice versa, or or you'll have someone else's clothes on that was on the craft. Mm-hmm. One little girl got picked up with a, and, and they gave her. She came back from her event from the woods with a, a with a, 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 a sergeant's military field jacket. You can imagine the six year old size T-shirt she was wearing that he, what he was trying to get on. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious something went something went on there. You didn't know anything about? They don't even get your clothes on right. They drop you off the wrong location, the wrong place. Sometimes you'll, you'll be a double tumbler lock, which means you have to have a key to get inside and key to get outside. And you get dropped off outside your house. And you didn't have your keys are on the inside of the house. Kind of proof that you didn't lock yourself out and do some sleepwalking. Sometimes they drop you off on the wrong street, the wrong city. And in one case that I have, they drop the two men off in the wrong state. Hmm. Like I said, it wasn't sleep paralysis. Yeah, you can't sleepwalk yourself to another state. You know, like <laughs> Not I in your truck with the wrong guy driving. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't sleepwalk from Texas to Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. My, a little difficult. My, I wanted to ask you, I have a two-part question, so I'm going to try to do this in chronological order. And, you know, you said you had had these unpleasant experiences with them until you were 17. So while that was going on in your life between, you know, four and 17, did any of these experiences influence you in your later life as to the choices you made for your career or personal choices? I mean, you, you became uh, this cop in the military. You've got this no nonsense approach. You're, you're known as the alien hunter. I mean, so what point did you decide you were going to be, you were going to hunt them, and what made you decide to go your career choices? Well, that's an easy question for me. Uh, everything ended for me at age 17. Uh, nothing seemed to be happening after that, and I was like, boy, I hope nothing like that ever happens again. It's over. <clears throat> and then one day, year, several years later, uh, married, got kid. He's uh, six years old. And I wake up about 2, 2.30 in the morning, something like that, around 2.30, 3 o'clock. That's when it usually happens. And I wake up, in a, and I mean, I know they are here. If you've been in these events, you know already what I'm talking about. You can, feel, you can sense them. And I ran as fast as I could through the house, as fast as I could. I ran past my little boy's room because I knew he wasn't in there. And I ran uh, through the hallway, stopped in the kitchen where I knew he was near there, and he was in the living room area looking out the back window. He was in a deep trance, and I, it's, I said, David, I watched him for a long time. I said, what are you looking at? He said, the little red light out there. Well, of course, there was no red light. That's a screen memory. Hmm. It just brought him back. Generally, whenever they take someone in a family like that, they nuke the whole family. By nuke, I mean everybody gets knocked out. Nobody wakes up. Generally, that's the case. Sometimes that doesn't work on everybody, but a lot of times it does. And um, he begged me, and so did my wife, and so did other people, to hypnotize him and work with him and use my NLP techniques and other techniques on him to find out what happened, and I didn't, I, it was the only case I ever didn't, I don't want to know. I do not want to know the answer to that. I already knew the answer. I didn't want it verified. And when I did work with him, finally, at his insistence, it was worse than I imagined. The, the entities that I met when I was 17 that were beyond horrific were the ones he met at age six. Hmm. I assure you, if you ever meet anything like that, it will forever color your consciousness. And at that point, I hunted them that hunted me, and then later came and hunted my son. I used to be afraid. I'm not anymore. I look forward to the event. So after you, your son started experiencing these uh, situations, did it kind of come back to you? 
Did they start seeking you out again, or? Oh, I, I wished I wished they had. I, 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 that would be a dream come true. Please, come get some. Not a problem. And is your son delighted still... to uh, cooperate? And is your son still now? I'm not. This? I'm not a victim anymore. I'm a. I'm. A, I'm a full blown witness. Mm-hmm. I know how to be a, a, a correct. Um, the the best way to say this is a is a uh, a, tra- a trained observer. Now, when I, I'm in these events, I train abductees on how to hear them, especially when they shut you off and they don't want you hearing what they're saying mm-hmm. between each other. You can actually be trained to actually turn yourself back on and hear it anyway, and they and you don't even have to let them know. The problem is people as contactees are in such awe or such amazement or such, oh, my God. I've got to fix the world. The universe is going to come apart. Really? Or an abductee who may be so scared or so frightened or so angered by what's going on, you're not paying attention. You're in awe or you're in fear or you're in anger, and you're not paying attention. You need to be a trained observer. Bring some evidence back with you. That's impossible. No, it's not. All you got to do is scratch the guy. Just scratch him. The evidence will be under your fingernails. That's another thing that fascinated me. I was going to bring that up for a second because um, I've often thought if I was going to be abducted, I would try to injure myself in some way if they were to do some kind of screen memory so that I could question, okay, why am I cut here? Why am I? Why is my toe broken? Or you know, Unless something. Unless they fix it. Um, well, that's true, but you know, at least mentally, I've always prepared myself for some kind of situation like that to to jar or to make me question. Is that too far off, uh, Daryl? For no, it's not far. No, no, that's that's wonderful thinking. Uh, in fact, uh, when I went to the VA hospital, my doctor, my primary care physician, when I first started going there, said. Uh, how do you feel? And I said, well, I'm, I'm fine. He says, well, he said, you, uh, you're, 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 I said, but I got a little pain over here on my, on this side. And he said, no, the pain's on the other side. And I said, don't tell me where my pain's at. You, you don't know if I have any pains or not. You don't know. And he said, no, he said, your broken ribs are on the other side. I said, I don't have any broken ribs. What are you talking about? He pulls up my, uh, radio, radiological chart and they're broken ribs. Has anybody ever had a broken rib or a bruised rib? Uh, you know how you move? Yeah. yeah. Slow motion. You can't hardly breathe. You can hardly think. My wife had a, a bru- bruised rib one time from our, our martial art training, and I'm telling you, for her just a bruised rib, uh, she got in a certain position, she would literally pass out the pain was so intense. You move in slow motion. You don't get a handful of broken ribs on one side, get them healed up during the abduction event, and then, uh, see, this was what gets parents arrested. Your kid's an abductee. This actually happened. Little girl uh, had a, an, a sprained wrist, and their doctor, uh, one of my abductees, x-rayed her arm, and, of course, found it had been broken a couple of places. Of course, he asked the parents the question, Where did, when did she get the broken arm? I, you know, I've never seen this she, since you you guys have been my patients forever. <laughs> And they said we we did we don't know. Well, of course, first thing it is call the police. I mean, you know, it's called child abuse. So the question is, and the little the only reason they didn't arrest is because they knew these people, and the little girl swore up and down, mom and dad had never touched her, never harmed her in any way, but she did have a story of alien abduction. The problem is, whenever you heal up, I don't care how good a job they do to patchwork on you. <clears throat> it still shows that it, the, that the bone was mended and so on. Here's my point. A, a lady told me one time, well, you just don't understand. They might have harmed you or something because you were reckless, or you, like I was reckless. Yeah, it's my fault. And But you just don't understand. They healed you. I said, no, they didn't heal me. They repaired me. They covered up the d- dirty work. Don't you get it? They covered it up. The idea is for you not to know. You come back with broken ribs, you can barely breathe or move. It's kind of obvious something happened to you. That's the only way we caught it was a VA doctor 
uh, got into an argument with a v, another VA doctor, and they were arguing about max rays, and the radiologist said, I make two hundred fifty nine dollars or whatever it was he was yelling at. I don't want to read an X-ray, and, and uh, he said he does have broken ribs, and he said, "I guess you do." And of course, I knew I did, but I didn't. I just wanted them to be able to prove it. And but there are other events too. That's just one uh, where other medical evidence suggests that I wasn't sleepwalking, breaking my ribs, and them healing up instantly so that I'd be <laughs> fine. I mean, that's, that's, those those answers are just so ludicrous. I just I can't I can't even fathom it. But the idea of uh, Checking yourself, one of the best things you can do if you if you think you have even been in an event, you've had strange dreams or unusual circumstance, missing time or anything, and you want to know, one of the best things you can do if you were physically touched and physically handled, you probably have a, a fluorescence on you that you will not be able to see with visible light. You have to get a black light, and at certain nanometer length, I guarantee you'll light up like a Christmas tree if you've been touched. I saw some of these examples uh, you mentioned. I don't know if it was the UPARS that you were speaking at, but you you had an example. It wasn't you know, the genuine, but you were showing how these may show up on your body. And some of those were really disturbing where I think you, you had a, a woman up there and you showed where there would be a fluorescence on, like, her shoulder or neck where they she they made her hold an ET baby, and that was its saliva. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> I want it. That's, uh, that's correct. Also, that is correct. That is true. What I didn't tell everybody, because the the guy that was there, the contactee that was there, that was horrified, horrified and mortified in that same meeting, did have fluorescence on him prior, but I didn't let anybody know it. Hmm. He was mortified. And, uh, in fact, uh, some of the things they do, depending on what program they got you on, and I, I don't... When I when I discuss sexuality in the UFO phenomena, I'm, it's never it's never personal, it's never pointed, and it's never uh, gender selective. It, in other words, I'm not picking on anybody. I never do that. I've never done that. He was a uh, straight, a uh, nice guy, uh, decent family. When they finished with him, he was one of these people that uh, um, got sexual reassignment. His consciousness was completely changed. Again, I'm not picking on one's sexual orientation. I, that, it's irrelevant to me. What I, the, my point here is simply that the consciousness of this person was so radically changed. He left his family, got a different sexual orientation, and, I mean, I haven't seen him since. But the last night I saw him was in that meeting when he had the fluorescence on him. I did take some samples. And, uh, you know, I, I was going to bring up earlier, um, I remember watching one of the episodes of um, Uncovering Aliens. Um, it was interesting um, how you went into, I guess it was at uh, off of the lake, of, uh, one of the lakes of Michigan, I can't think of exactly. And you went into this young lady's room and it started scanning her, her walls for, I guess, residue from, I guess, aliens. And you were saying something to the effect that they excrete, uh, I guess, oils or something and, and leave this residue. Uh, what I found fascinating, though, later is that uh, she had this small little bat. And, um, you know, you said, you know, it's great that that brings you comfort, but this isn't going to solve it for you. I mean, this is not going to protect you. Um, and I think later on, I, I guess I was listening to you on something else. And what it came down to is... Uh, you're saying putting something in your mind that makes them think, okay, why are they doing that? Um, would you like to elaborate more on that? Sure. Uh, this is particularly important. One of the things that parents come to me for um, at these conferences and, and after shows like this, as an example, I'll get emails and they'll, the question they'll have privately, of course, is my son, my daughter's been taken. I, the one lady even had two little kids. I mean, the little tiny tykes, and she was in tears when she saw me. And I looked at, her, I knew what it was. I said, uh, "They get are they getting both of them?" And she just shook her head and cried. She didn't know what to do. And a wonderful lady, sweetheart, sweetheart of a lady, Pentecostal, uh, one of the a Christian, you know, good fine Christian lady, and uh, you know, just never think something like that could happen to somebody normal, good, and decent person. Uh, I assure you, it can. And it doesn't make them any difference what religion you are. Uh, but the uh, 
the way that um, um, I guess um, I guess one of the ways I guess you can think about that is <clears throat> that I tell parents to tell their children is have them if they have these bad dreams or bad circumstances where they can't move they can't do this just start singing this song and I give them an illustration because a lot of kids remember the song or they or they, it doesn't matter what I didn't matter which one it's irrelevant only that it's a it's called a confusion pattern in NLP and the idea is confuse the person that you're dealing with and you start singing the song M I C K E Y M O U S E and just say it just in, eternally don't let up now if a person's a moron that just picked you up with an IQ of 80 what do you think that's going to do in his little headspace when you do it enough Confusing. They're going to take you back because there's something wrong with your wiring, <laughs> and they can't, they can't deal with you. They're going to say, this is this defective. Is Let's news. put them back. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's good news. It, it won't stop all abductions, but it'll sure mess that one up. <laughs> so th- this is, it's a hint is what it is. I'm just giving people hints of things they can do. Uh, we're not helpless. Uh, I will tell you this. I don't normally do this on a, on a program, but we have actually been able to hypnotize uh, the alien on three different occasions. And I use the word hypnosis lightly because uh, that's not exactly what it was, but it doesn't matter. We had control of him like he had control of us. They are not gods. They are not impervious to everything. He's got the IQ of 80. He's not exactly brilliant. And the ones that are, I said, you just have to use something different on them. So it, 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 it depends. The the point being that uh, they 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 have flaws. They they're not perfect. They're not anything like what they have tech. And because they have tech, people think they're oh my god, they're hundred thousand light years ahead of us. I just, there's millions of light years. No, there's no question about it. Doctor Bob Wood uh, during the Uncovering Aliens show, the last one he shot in Sedona, came uh, came there. We were meeting in an airport, all talking, asking questions of him. He's presenting all kinds of good information. Good, good man. And he said, Daryl, may I speak to you privately for a moment and when we had the break? And I said, of course. And he asked some questions uh, that were of an intelligence nature uh, from the intelligence community, and I answered them as best I could. And then he asked another question, and the other everybody was coming back over about that time. We're starting to film again. And he said, Daryl, I have a, a question I want to ask you. He said, I, I want your honest, direct opinion on this. And I said, fine. He said, how far do you think the aliens are ahead of us? And I said, Doc, if I answered that, I said, everybody laughed me out of the building. He said, please answer the question. I really want to know what you think. And I said, sir, they're no more than 15 to 50 years ahead of us. And everybody laughed me to scorn, including the camera people. Dr. Woods was the only person that wasn't laughing with me. And everybody quit laughing, and he looked at, looked over at me, and he said, those are the exact figures I came up with. How in God's name, where did you get those figures? And I said, I got them in 1960. I said, I figured out, based on what they were doing to me, Later, I did, I did all kinds of testing and all kinds of stuff on myself when I am in my 20s and 30s, 40 years old, and figured out they're no more than 15, 50 years ahead of us. Oh, they're no, they're millions? No, they're not. Again, where did you read that? On the Internet? Where, did you get, where do you get your information? <laughs> I got mine from being there. Oh, they have to be. No, they have to be because you assign human values and human circumstances to them. I know they, they, it takes a 26 light years to get from here, there to here. Give me a break. You're watching too many shows. Quit watching Contact. Watch something else, like <laughs> a real event with you in it. <laughs> so Travis Walton is a good example. Travis said, well, I was only gone for a few minutes, in my opinion. And he said, yet yeah, they said I was gone for several days. Uh, Daryl, what do you think? And I said, Travis, I said, I've always defended you to the hilt. And the reason is because you were telling the truth. You've never changed your story. I said, here's the deal. I said, if you're traveling at a relativistic speed, I said, that the, 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 the thesis is based on the position of each observer. If you're here, 
if we're here and you're out there traveling at a relative at relativistic speed, you may have only been gone for five minutes, but to us it had been five days. Mm-hmm. I said both answers are correct. They're both correct. He said, I never thought of that. And I said, well, relatively speaking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you said that, uh, if you said this earlier, that concepts like individual thought and freedom, like we have, are alien to them. Is that what you said or something to that effect? It is. It's an infestation. It would never be allowed in their... their, now that one of the sounds, reasons you're yeah. not allowed. One of the reasons you're not allowed to talk. It, it, it's a it's a statement everybody knows, and not one person has an answer for. It. Why are you not allowed to talk on that ship? Gives them ideas, I guess, above their station. Why can't you talk on a ship? I mean, what is the real reason? Go on the internet and see if you can find that one. There are reasons for this stuff, and it's about it's it's all about control. It always has been. And the issue is to cover things up and to make to to be in control. Mm-hmm. And this is this this is part and parcel to the whole uh, phenomena. And we cannot uh, we have to penetrate that. And there are ways of doing it. Um, I hunt them that hunted me and hunted my son. When I say hunt, I don't mean hypnotize some people and get some more cases. I have enough cases that are coming out of my ears. I don't need any more cases in that regard. Only cases I even do now are physical evidence cases or surgeries that I do, this sort of thing. So uh, I, I have I have my own agenda. I do, and I've, I've always admitted this. And uh, everybody says, well, what are, you, what, are you, what are you working on now? I said, well, what I'm working on now is exactly what I want you looking at. I said, I don't want you looking at the things I'm doing. I'll tell you what I want you to look at, and you can play with that. I said, the fact is, I have my own agenda. And, well, why don't you just go tell us and tell everybody else? And, and a good example is one of my, my my senior investigator got abducted with eight other people in a mass abduction on December 8th and December 11th. It was a double mass abduction. happened three nights apart, twice, on December 8th and December 11th, 1992, in two states and several cities. All these people recognize each other. They knew the exact where they, they were all taken by a small craft to a massive craft. My senior investigator, who was an engineer type, look, <clears throat> told me about the story, and I, I, I said, uh, he, I, <laughs> I looked at him really weird. He says, the craft 50 miles thick and 600 miles across, that's, uh, you don't believe that, do you? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it, Dale. I'm struggling. And uh, he said, I thought you would. So I bought the video, and he had a video that someone had taken in Japan during the time of the mass abduction, and apparently they filmed what could have been the craft, a massive craft near the moon, massive. Mm-hmm. You can see the shadow of it going across the moon. My point is that the thing that he that happened in that event, one of the many amazing things, is that... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, number one, that's the that was one of the events where uh, I gave a post. Not that's not it's not not even fair to say that. A specialized technique that I used for Dale, and uh, he actually uh, took control of the alien uh, there. The second thing is that uh, the uh, the entities themselves. Uh, the reason the mass abduction took place was because I decided to hunt them. Literally, well, how are you going to cut them? Well, one of the ways you can do that is to bro. Uh, if you if you're going to hunt, if, if you're going to if you want to if you're going to deal in the in the intelligence area, you have to deal with intelligence level stuff. What would cause an alien to do what you wanted him to? Hold that thought. Well, uh, hold that thought, Daryl. Uh, so we can take our break, and then we'll pick up that answer when we come back. You are listening to Space Boy Universe, and tonight's guest is Daryl Sims, and Serlana and I are wrapping it up with him in in the sense of talking, and we'll do some more talking and possibly take your calls a little bit later. So don't go anywhere. I 
Yes, the, some more Space Boy music there. That one's called LP. Uh, that was an oldie, but it's been re-released on some newer music uh, CDs. But speaking of music CDs, you can get my newest CD on spaceboymusic.com. It's Unique Technique, 17 Tracks of Wonderfulness, and uh, for just $10 for a digital download, it can be yours. There's the commercial. Makes a great so, gift for Grandma. Yes. So more <laughs> talk. Uh, sir, uh, what we left off yes, is exactly. uh, uh, he was, Daryl, you're going to tell us about how do you draw these guys to you when you're, you know, you're looking for them? How do you get them to come to you? Yeah, I mean, who wants to do that? I mean, who wants to invite them over for dinner? And, and especially when you see a human mutilation for real. You get to thinking, huh, abduction may not be exactly everything it's cracked up to be. What if they decided they wanted to do something different with me? 
So uh, you have to think about all these things whenever you design something like this. But being in the intelligence community at one time and uh, and being educated in some of that um, motif, um, I uh, look for, uh, and then, now let me frame this to your audience so that it'll make more sense. If uh, I were, and I'm not, in an intelligence community like Mossad, the uh, the Israeli uh, intelligence community, let's say I was at your house one night for dinner, and all of a sudden you blurted out certain information about the Mossad and Mossad's secret plan that we had operation we had going at the time. Do you think I, and you didn't know I was Mossad, do you think I might be interested in you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, you're going to be watched for the rest of your life. So the question is, how did you get information that no one had any access to? So you're going to be monitored for a long, long time. So that's the way you have to think in reference to the alien. How can I get alien information that I'm not supposed to have and feed it back to them to see if it works? This is what I did. And I found information inside a, an abductee one night that we was not supposed to tell me anything and I got it out of him anyway. And I thought, you know, this is pretty, if this is real, if the, and I don't know what it is, but if this information is valid and I were them, I would be mortified that this was out. So I took a lady and I asked her to volunteer for me. She did. She said, you never charge us a dime for anything. And I said, that's correct. And she says, uh, my God, this is sure. What do you want me to do? I said, I need you to be a surrogate. She said, for what? I said, I can't tell you. I can't tell you anything. You're a contactee. I can't tell you anything. Just, you just have to volunteer and I'm going to put it all on tape so that it's recordable and all that. And she agreed. And I, I did my specific techniques that I designed for this. And I implanted the information in her mind from this abductee guy who had probably mistakenly overheard this information from them. He shouldn't have, but he did. I implanted it in her as if it were a memory. Now, I set it to go off within, with the alien got within 19, 18, 19 inches of her, 20 inches, that it would automatically go off as opposed to my suggestion. It did. About a month later, they came, showed up at her house, picked her up, And she blurted this stuff out. And I mean to tell you, she said, I've been abducted. So I'm 33 years old. He, I've been picked up since I was three. My captor was there. The the guy always picks me up. And she says, when I blurted that stuff out, she said, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen emotion on his face. He was mortified. Well, that's a pretty good indicator that uh, you rang his bell. Wow. You said you did you did the big one. You said something that only they know and it's not the BS of they're taking DNA samples of us. Well, we really know all kinds of stuff. No, you really don't. You really don't have a clue. The fact is when that information went out, it was so bad that a month later they picked up they came and picked it. that was what caused the mass abduction. The mass abduction was a craft that showed up 50 miles, 600 miles across that we do have a film up, we think of. We have eight witnesses who told some of the most incredible stuff you've ever heard, all coordinated and corroborated by each of them independently without have them having the ability to speak to each other. So I've got all their testimonies separately. Absolutely incredible information. <clears throat> and the bottom line is two entities showed up that are not part of the alien uh, show. Everybody on the craft that was an alien was scared out of their wits when these two characters showed up. The reason they showed think of them as the intelligence community showing up at the uh, at a little military base or something, and uh, the really hot shots of the, the intelligence community showed up because you screwed up somehow. And they brought my senior investigator in. Obviously, if you wonder what I'm doing, you would get him. And the other person they had in the other room, the other guy had, was the lady that I had programmed. Mm -hmm. And they asked several questions. One of the questions was, they want to know where I got that information. As soon as 
they, the, the guy, the, the big guy sitting in the chair asked the question mentally. And guess who was lined up over there watching this whole show? The little alien, the doctor type, the mantis being. <laughs> every one of them, Bigfoot was dead. Every one of them, the Nordic. And when Dale said, uh, of course, he said, I knew what he was talking about when he said it, because you see in images, you get the whole picture. And he said, "How did? why did he do this, speaking of me? And Dale said, I don't know. And the guy went ballistic. He was so angry. It scared everybody. It scared all the aliens that were there half to death because they don't know what he's going to do. And he could do anything to them. So uh, the Nordic, who's Dale 6'2", uh, and this Nordic is about 6'7", six, 6'8", six, he goes over and puts those big, beautiful blue eyes right next to Dale's, where putting forehead to forehead, looks into his eyes with those big, beautiful blue eyes, and looks back at the head guy and says, he's telling the truth. And the guy cooled off. And then he asked another question. He said, um, what is Project Prometheus? Apparently they had abducted someone who was part of an intelligence program and he was part and parcel to a UFO program to steal technology from the alien called Prometheus Project. Dale didn't have a clue about that. The last question he asked, he produced a computerized human brain in front of Dale and said, point to the human soul. Where is it? Now, that was rather interesting. In the other room, the lady has asked the same questions, independent of Dale. And she said they had a, she used the word a computer screen on the wall, but I don't know what it was. It wasn't a computer screen. She said, but they showed me a, a picture of a human brain, and they said, point to the human spirit. Where is it? She said, I told them I didn't have a clue. She said, the only person that might have a clue, in my view, she said, might be Pearl Young. They want to know who he was and where he was because they were going to abduct him and find out if he knew. Interesting stuff, huh? That's my They're looking blowing. at medical stuff. They're wanting to do medical <laughs> things. Really? Maybe that's not exactly what they're after. That that kind of, I wonder, because I've heard like from Linda Moulton Howe and, and other stories like aliens, maybe these not these same guys, but able to ex supposedly extract the soul and put it in a shoebox and then inhabit you and then put you back in if they want to. I, I mean, I know that's pretty much out there. I don't know if that's... Yeah, that's but she, 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 these are just different investigators come up with different ideas because yeah. they, sometimes they run out of soap to to sell. And uh, I, I, I think there's a... That's, I don't know very many alien shoeboxes that I've seen that have souls laying around yeah. in them. I, I think uh, it's interesting what you just... Two souls might be closer. Yeah. But uh, the fact is that, uh, that, if, that one of the things they are uh, greatly interested in, and you have to think of it in another way, it, it, it just, it just in a real logical sense of the word. Some Let's assume they came from another dimension, another world, uh, millions of light years away, whatever it is, whatever whopper you want to believe in. Somebody's come a long, long, long way. To get whatever it is you have mm -hmm. they don't have it you do there's a need for it and the fact is they don't need you they just need what you have and the only way they can separate you from that is called death and that doesn't work very well because now they don't get either one of them right so that's not a very productive method so one of the things they may be more interested in is something along that line but the fact is that uh, stealing people's souls and things like that, I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. walk-ins and things like that, I mean, I, I, I think I've heard it all about a dozen times. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't jive. Well, the, the, doesn't work for me. The encounter you just you just uh, told us, that seems to back up what you said they work like an intelligent, intelligence agency. Maybe I misheard, but it sounds like they did a mass abduction to try to find the leak, and then they Thank interrogated you. them. To find, and they, oh, they, did. they found your bait and wanted to know, I guess, did they find out it was you that learned yes, all this information? Yes, they did, and they found out, they found out early, and the, the, the problem was that the lady I worked with made a huge mistake. When she blurted out all the information, the first thing she said is, <laughs> I can't believe she did this, 
she's in a trance, you know, walking toward this guy. He's fixed to walk off with her into the craft or beam or whatever is going to happen to her. And as soon as she gets within 20 inches of him, the post-hypnotic suggestion goes off, bang, she's wide awake, totally coherent. She looks at him and says, Daryl knows what you're doing. Well, she knows who Daryl is. They know. I mean, I'm in the database. They know. One knows. They all know. It's a hive mentality. If they're all on their own alien internet, they know who that is. And he was mortified. And then she blurted out the information. So they, they figured out, put two and two together, oh, my God, this is a secret, super secret information of ours, and guess where she got it? So that part of the program failed. But the di- part of the program that worked beautifully was they operate like an intelligence community. What did I say if I was in the Mossad and listening to you and you at dinner and you said all this weird stuff about the Mossad that you weren't supposed to know? You think we're going to come visit you? Of course we are. So guess what happened? They they came and got eight of our people. They they're going to find the leak. It's mm-hmm. that simple. And they were mortified that I was able to do that. And it's just the like important what we would thing do. is, we got them to react to us for the first time in history. The first time. Because that sounds just like a like a CIA, CIA operation. Where you well, I up. guess I must have been there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that that backs up your your notion of they work just like, you know, an operative agency. They do. They lie, and they lie consistently, and they create huge cover stories. The problem is many investigators accept their cover stories as the truth. Oh, my God. He said a ridiculous lie. He told me so. Oh, I know. I know. I know it's true because he told me that. He told me to my face. Oh, God, it's amazing. Really? We have another term for those type people in the uh, intelligence community. I won't insult anybody with it, but uh, but they, we love people like that. Man, are you easy to use? Let me uh, ask you, uh, Daryl, and and I'm going to just come forward. Is you know a lot of people um, uh, I've read claim th- that you might be a disinformation agent. How do you respond oh, to that? Oh, that's possible, yeah. The best answer to that is, uh, uh, I've been accused of that before. One guy accused me of that on a, on a huge radio program, and I said, you know, I, I, said, I, no, I said, rather than argue with you, I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I said, I'll put up $50,000, you put up $50,000, we'll get a proctor, and we both agree to. It can be anybody we, you want. And if I can prove to you that I was in the intelligence community while in the military. I get your fifty thousand bucks. If I can't prove it to our proctor, you get mine. You and a fish are cut bait. Well that ended the conversation right there. <laughs> I said the fact is if you think you're gonna call the Central Intelligence Agency, hey Bill Sim, work for you boys? Oh yeah, I love it. In fact, let me tell you who our uh, our local uh, uh, case officers are and uh, in your, your neighborhood, and uh, who the local station chiefs are as well. Nobody's going to tell you anything, period. However, when I left the company, I did certain things. Number one is copy certain documents that were given to me that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that I, in fact, was in the Central Intelligence Agency, that I was, in fact, a military, like a military attachment to the company. It's called sheep dipping. <laughs> they dip into the sheep. You're not a mm-hmm. CIA spy. Sorry, I didn't get to be that. I was asked to be that whenever I left. To go ahead and finish my ed- college education, come back and with a high GS rating. I did, wasn't interested. Not interested. So if, uh, I, I, and I get accused of this by especially my detractors. Well, you, you're a CIA spy. Well, when are you going to start paying me? I'd like to collect the money if I'm going to be doing this stuff. I never, it just can't get paid. So the bottom line is, um, is uh, one of the things I did before I left the Central Intelligence Agency is I, and the reason I left the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, it's a three-year deal with when you're in in your volunteer during the Vietnam War. Uh, it's a three-year hitch. Um, I ended up spending only two years there. I mean, the big question one has to ask is why is that? Because we ended up in a massive lawsuit. Why is that? Because somebody violated my First Amendment right. I took them to court, I, so to speak. 
took them to uh, the chairman, Mendel Rivers, of the House Armed Services Committee, who handled my case personally because I had about two inches thick paperwork to prove every word I said. Uh, and I was exiled out of the continental United States, put placed back into the military at that point, exiled to, to AFCOM Korea for the rest of my duration, the rest and last year of my uh, enlistment. The case continued while I was in Korea. So uh, for those out there that have a brain that actually read intelligence information, I'm no longer family. That's all you need to know. When you violate, if you if you take the CIA to court, you're no longer family. You're out. That's you're never going to be part of any of that anymore. I'm worse than a civilian. I'm closer to a traitor in their view. Hmm. I went against the company. You don't do that. Fact is, I never exposed them because I never told anybody who they were. They thought it was a military problem. <laughs> Boy, are you dense. <laughs> I hadn't been in the military for two years, really. You check my pay stubs of where, who was paying me. It wasn't the United States Army. Well, I think it's, like I said, it was fascinating. Something I asked you during the break, I was going to wait to ask you here is, so you do have all that experience, uh, CIA, with, you know, investigating uh, maybe crime scenes and interrogation. So how are you able to go from wearing uh, like like investigative cop to somebody who is actually therapeutic and caring uh, when you're trying to uncover, when you're trying to get to the truth, especially somebody that's been abducted? I know you've got to separate out the fact from the fiction and then you've got to get to the caring person. Well, you do, and, and, and we have to be, um, uh, I do, I don't I guess don't have to be, but I am uh, very careful with these people because I have great respect for them. I know what they've been through, uh, but by the same token, I, uh, when, it, when I put on my, I have seven different hats that I wear, and each of these hats, it's like giving me 14 sets of eyes to see with, and all of these eyes these 14 sets of eyes that are uh, seven sets of eyes, 14 eyes that look at things, they're all different. I have a Native American hat that I wear. I have an investigator hat. I have a medical scientific hat. And uh, all these different, an intelligence hat, and all these different hats, and they all think totally differently. Totally. And when that investigator, uh, the therapy guy gets in front of you, he's as kind and sweet and help you do anything in the world anything protect you in every way when that investigator hat gets on it can get pretty brutal and a little scary because he doesn't believe anything you're saying and he's looking for mistakes and and i have some very effective skills that are, go through people very rapidly I, I go different countries and like brazil and i don't speak brazilian at all and portuguese and uh, as a result uh I have I have a very short period of time to talk to 250 people in line. I have to go through those people like very rapidly. So um, I use use those particular skills, uh, and I, I do everything from handwriting analysis. Uh, when you fill out a 20 page questionnaire, the, those questions are very invasive. Some of them are even offensive. Uh, and I tell people if you don't feel comfortable filling them out, don't fill them out. You know, you don't have to do anything. Uh, but in interest, your name is taken off of it. We don't want your name. We don't need all that. What we need is just the information. But I am going to verify that that information, in fact, is correct. And I'm going to do that by monitoring you. I'm going to look at your handwriting analysis. If you have a propensity to lie, exaggerate, and do things like that, it's going to show up in your handwriting. If you uh, are lying when I'm questioning you, I'm going to catch you anyway. If you've been programmed by the alien to give me disinformation, I'm going to catch that too. I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to know it. That's important to me. I want to know when I'm being spoon-fed too. I'm not immune to being spoon-fed. They will spoon-feed me as quick as they will anybody. The only difference is I know when I'm being spoon-fed. So that's kind of important to know as an investigator. Otherwise, um, <clears throat> You're not going to survive very long out there doing this stuff. 
Well, we're close to the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and take the uh, top of the hour break, and uh, that way we can take some calls if you're up to it. Sure. All right, awesome. So uh, let's take the break, and um, we'll get that patched in. And you're listening to Space Boy Universe with Space Boy and Solana. Thanks for exploring the universe with us. And tonight's special guest is Daryl Sims, so don't go anywhere. You're listening to Space Boy Universe on the SBU Network. You can check us out on sbunetwork.com and spaceboyuniverse.com. Tonight, Space Boy and Solana are exploring the universe with Daryl Sims. And we pick back up. Uh, where are we at, Solana? Well, something I've been wanting to really ask you um, to get your opinion, Daryl, on uh, Another person I enjoy, what's, it's weird to say you enjoy them, but I, let's say I just find them fascinating, is um, David Politis. Where, and, I, and I wonder how you, know, you approach things as a procedural evidence investigation, and like you look at things like a crime scene. So I wonder what your thoughts would be on when Politis talks about the disappearance of people, especially young children as one and two years old, with no evidence that you'd be used to, to looking for the physical evidence. And like he describes in his missing 401 cases, and he has um, uh, one case where they did recover a very young girl who took, who was taken along with her brother. And she said a big bear man came out of the woods, took her brother and said, I'm going to take him away to play for a while. I didn't I don't know what your, your thoughts were for people that go missing with no evidence like that. So. Sure. The uh, the fact is this kind of stuff has happened over the years, but again, most of it's not reported until recently. When when you see stuff like this, it's usually in uh, countries that don't have um, great media circumstances, and we do. And so whenever this happens, uh, generally 
most of it's going to be covered up as much as possible because it's bad PR. It's bad mm-hmm. for the government. It's bad for everybody. That's what he says. It's bad for everybody. So they're not going to they're not going to admit to any of this. Mm-hmm. But, but if you dig right, and and I know David, and he's done an excellent job, and he's a good investigator. He's a good cop, and he has dug into the matter uh, very well. He's got good credibility. He's, he's, his cases are solid. Uh, the difference between, I think, uh, David and myself would be that uh, my business, uh, his business is to investigate at this point in his life. Mine is to find the culprit. I hunt them that hunt me, so to speak, and I intend to catch them. Uh, by the same token, if somebody ends up taking my kid or somebody else's kid, I am not content with with proving the fact that they did it. Mm-hmm. I want the kidnapper. I don't want to go tell the parents, oh, I'm sorry, you know. We, we know for a fact that it really happened, and this is incredible. Wow. I, that's not going to be good enough. They want their kid back. They want something done. So in the case of something like that, your first hint that something uh, where the kid came back, so to speak, or where there was a witness in some way or another, a big hairy man or whatever, could this be Bigfoot? Do we have mm-hmm. Bigfoot in abduction scenarios? Yes, we do. Remember, I told you that he was on board that craft, that massive craft I told you about? Mm-hmm. He was in the, the usual suspects lineup, just like the other models were. There's no difference between him and any of the others. In fact, if you look at his DNA, which they actually have DNA samples of, and I have my own private samples as well, I can assure you that that DNA is human being, it's modern woman, modern woman, not ancient, modern woman, and Simeon, some type of ape creature. Now, how do you get a modern woman and, a, and an ape creature mixed? Well, you'd have to get the DNA from planet Earth, take it out there somewhere, work on it, and uh, let your alien Dr. Moreau work on his little stuff and bring her, bring it back, so to speak, and then uh, your new model would look ape-like. And uh, In fact, after a while, you'd have a big following of Bigfoot people after a while, even pass laws to protect him. So the first hint is that some the big guy got me and uh, and took me away, and that's that's a pretty good hint. Something big and coherent could speak inside that kid's mind or to the kid, and and, and let him know that what was going to happen. That's a huge hint to me. Mm-hmm. If true. That was one of the few um, odd cases he related. Most of these. They either never find the person or, you know, they, unfortunately they find just bits and pieces of their clothes or, you know, occasionally we'll find a deceased. But it's just, you know, it's all in our public parks that he talks about. And, you know, it's happening all over the planet. That, that is true. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure of that. And, and it should be alarming to everyone. But the fact is it's kept pretty much under wraps and, and only the quote-unquote fringe element out there will buy into it. Uh, but the fact is, it's not your kid. When it's your kid, you're, you become the fringe very quickly. Where's my kid? Where are my children? Mm-hmm. And the fact is, we have human mutilation cases. Uh, uh, many of them that we do have are in other parts of the world. Uh, we do have a couple here. In the, we have one in Dallas, actually, two children in Dallas that got uh, got died as a result of their event. <clears throat> but my point is that... Uh, uh, even mutilation cases are part of the UFO program. It depends on what the program is. These aliens will do anything their bosses tell them to do. If they're instructed to cause you to believe them, to become a, an environmentalist, and to uh, do all these wonderful things, you will do that with great glee. If they're told to mutilate you like a cow, mm-hmm. they will do so just as quickly, hmm. without a thought. I'm not going to sleep tonight, I don't think. Well, Daryl, when we were talking earlier during our break, um, I told you that, uh, you know, I was, um, I've watched, uh, uh, I guess, the four episodes that you have out there of alien, uncovering aliens. And one of the things I saw that you used, and and, and I guess you, uh, in, in police work, they use it too, where it's like a flip book where, you know, you try to match up the, uh, 
the perp as close as you can get them and and it reminded me of something as a as a kid and it, it happened back in the late uh, or kind of mid i guess mid 70s basically what i was i was sitting in my uh, parents living room and it was i guess it was summertime because um, it, it was a morning good morning show i guess on channel 13 here in in houston and as the segment in i guess they were talking about doing something sci-fi and i'm guessing it was star wars related because i I guess it puts it about the same time frame but um right as they were going to the next segment they they displayed this picture and it was a sketch of a gray and immediately when i saw that as a kid when i'm watching this i went into a panic attack and when i saw it and i wanted to get your feelings beyond that now to my knowledge I don't think I've ever been abducted or anything, but it, it, it has always been a point in my life that when I have seen greys or to that effect, it has always left me in this fight, uh, flight or fight kind of uh, situation. But when, as a kid, I remember distinctively, I couldn't breathe. I saw this thing and it was like uh, I was just panicked and I wanted to get your take on that. But you may not have been abducted, but you may have seen the entity. And it's a it's a very startling experience for a child. Uh, it didn't scare me or anything because it didn't. It, well, I wasn't supposed to wake up. I wasn't supposed to be awake. So uh, to give you kind of an example, there while I was on the show, um, the uh, there's two of the people there. I'm the abductee, and we've got a contactee there. And he is basically believes that they're here to the aliens here to save the planet, fix the ozone hole. He's going to take care of everybody else, and we're all we should all be happily joining hands, singing kumbaya around the fire. <laughs> um, I'm not of that belief uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, the evidence doesn't support it, and many of my cases do not. However, in his view, he is absolutely correct, and and I have to respect that because uh, because I do respect other people's views. But I, uh, <clears throat> I knew he had events that he was hor- horrified of that he didn't know. Of course, he could scarcely imagine that. And uh, one night we were in the in the program, and um, and I brought up my flip chart, and I started flipping the chart, and had the abductee start drawing some pictures, and he drew some pictures that I mean, it scared the contactee so bad, he stood up got upset and you see him on the film Mm -hmm. he gets up and actually leaves the set he said i'm I'm very disturbed by that mantis being i that i've never seen that before but that that but disturbs me well the fact is he has seen it he's remembering now he's remembering past his screen memory he has seen it he's not supposed to remember and when he saw that it bothered him so bad and and I told him, I said, you know, I said, something's going to happen. I said, if we go to second season, I said, we had dinner our last night, he and I privately. And I said, I just want to tell you something. I said, I know we're of totally different views. And uh, and and I know nothing's going to convince you or change your mind. I said, but I, I want to tell you something for you to protect yourself. He said, what do you mean? I said, if we go to second season, they're going to want me to work with you. He said, what's wrong with that? I said, you have no idea how good I really am. <laughs> I said, whatever it is you think that didn't happen, and whatever did happen, you're going to remember all of it. And you're probably not going to like it. I wanted you to know that in advance, because I am not going to uh, bushwhack you on the show. You need to know this right up front. And I said, he's, well, I'm not afraid of being hypnotized. I said, you're missing my whole point. I don't even have to hypnotize you. I said, that's not my point. My point is what you're probably going to find out is going to destroy your entire little world of aliens. And I really would rather not do that. I don't mind you believing your views. I said, but if you get me in there, I said, you're not going to like what I'm going to find. I am relatively sure of that. I said, the drawings the other night that scared you so bad that you walked off the set? I said, I assure you, you know all about that. You just don't remember it. But if I work with you, you will. And you probably are going to wish you had not remembered any of it. 
I said, just a word of advice. And I said, I, I just would like to, I'm just being totally truthful with you. And I, and I just don't want you hurt. And I said, and I will not be part of a program to prove how smart I am and how blinded you are by your stuff. I said, I, I, I don't do stuff like that. I'm that's, that's uh, intellectually dishonest in my opinion, and I won't be a part of it. Wow. I, I heard you speak that, you know, these abductees, experiencers that don't quite remember, and they, you know, let's say they want to do the your hypnotic, you know, regression or whatever to find out what really happened. You say, you caution them, it says, do you sit down, you have a talk with yourself, do you really want to open that box? Are you absolutely sure, you know, you're going to be able to handle it? You said you won't ever be the same person again. You won't. That's just, you won't. That was chilling for me, so. It is. And the people need to, they need to make sure, that, and, and, and like I told him, I said, you have, you're in a great place, you remember what it is they want you to remember, you're happy, and I said, I would prefer you to be happy, and I don't care if you're blind or whatever. I mean, it, it's your brain, and you choose, and I don't want you unhappy. I said, if you're happy that way, I'm, I'm okay with that. It doesn't change my investigations or knowledge base whatsoever. So I don't mind you being happy and believing in something else. It doesn't bother me in the least. Well, the other stories that bother me personally to hear and I find them sometimes more disturbing than maybe with the abduction scenarios is any time you talk about the men in black and I'm not talking about the Hollywood men in black or government agents men in black but the ones that aren't human men in black sure the MIB uh, or men in black the alien version mm -hmm. is an ent entity that is their prime the best way to think of them is um uh it, the alien screws up a lot they make mistakes they can't get your clothes on right they do this they can't sometimes get get, get somebody to cooperate or do whatever when the mid shows up generally what that is is he's there to clean up a problem they can't solve and he's there to, to fix it rectify it and clean it up and get it to work that's pretty much what he does and he's usually very effective about it. But um, you said um, a woman had a count an encounter with one and somehow ended up, ended up getting their handwriting because she startled them or t caught them off guard. She did. Again, they make mistakes. If you know how to capitalize or if you accidentally capitalize, and she did accidentally capitalize on it. She was a therapist of all things, working at an apartment complex. Sometimes therapists get out of work too. Mm -hmm. And needed some money, so she was working uh, at an apartment complex, signing people up for apartments as an apartment manager. <clears throat> and she walked around the corner, and there he is standing there, about eight foot tall, strange looking face, um, odd looking shoes. His shoes were very shiny and very large. And she, God, she said he had the strangest long nose I've ever seen. She said it, she laughed, said it, was, it reminded me of Richard Nixon. Yeah. I said I can assure you, it was not him. And she said, oh, I'm sure of that. I said, in fact, that, that screen of him was probably useful for them. I said, what happened? She said, I was so stunned. She's a little diminutive. So young, I've got a picture of her. Uh, and anyway, she just looked up and everything. She says, uh, uh, she shoved this, uh, this uh, notebook in his hand and said, fill this out. And he didn't know what to do. And so he started filling it out. I said, oh, my God, you have the handwriting of a MIB. She said, yeah, he fell out the form. I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea? I said, I'm a handwriting analyst. Would that be interesting to me to look at the neurology, the psychology of an alien, a MIB in particular, his handwriting? <laughs> that would be huge. <laughs> oh, my. It yeah, seems like the, it, it seems really like the best tactic uh, to catch these people off guard um, is to, I guess, do the unexpected. Uh, it seems to be our greatest weapon. It, it really is. Uh, they simply don't get it. I mean, they they're not really prepared for you. you okay, uh, Bud Hopkins and I had a discussion one time. And he says, uh, 
I said, why do you think, uh, why do you think, uh, why do you think it's so easy for them to abduct us? And he said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, the reason is because we have habits, bud. This is Marseille, France, 1994. I said, we have habits, bud. And I said, and because we have habits, we're easy to catch. If you're a good hunter, you know the habits of the things you hunt. If you're a trapper, you know exactly where they run, where they do what they do, and you build the right kind of trap. That's what you do. I said, that is the nature of the beast, because they have habits. I said, you know anything about the bighorn mountain sheep? And he says, no. And I said, well, they can't be captured. They can't be caught in a trap. You can get a helicopter and throw a net over them if you want to, but you're not going to be able to. They're, they're, I said, they don't have any habits. It's the reason you can't catch them. He said, what does that have to do with anything? I said, I'm trying to give you a quick lesson here on how to catch an alien. I said, they know how to catch you because you have habits. What does that have to do with anything? I said, bud. <clears throat> when an abductee comes to you, I said, do you kind of, if it's a real abductee, do you kind of know what's already going to be said kind of before it's even said? He said, yeah. I said, why do you think that is? He said, because a lot of events are similar. And I said, okay, that makes sense. I said, uh, what I'm trying to get across to you is that the alien has habits, doesn't he? And he got real quiet. And I said, if he has habits, he can be caught. And he said, well, that's impossible. And I said, bud, it's been done before. And he said, where? I said, Roswell, 1947. Just as one example, somebody made a mistake. Crash got crashed. Bodies, one of them survived. Somebody made a mistake. All we need to do is recapitalize on the same mistakes. Well, it's impossible. And I said, only to you. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, you. I've brought this up to Serlana many times that um, we all seem to go in these, these loops. Um, we get up in the morning, get our clothes on, go to work, do our thing, come home, eat dinner, go to bed. So it would make sense that uh, you'd have these beings would be easy to pick off uh, humans that live these loops, if you will, and, and you know, pick them off pretty easily. By the same token, whenever you do get picked off, so to speak, and as one lady did in Austin, Texas, she went to work one time by herself. Well, she always rode with her friend, and she will not go down that, that road anywhere near that road for the rest of her life. In fact, if her friend can't go to work that day or that week, she will not go to work at all. Hmm. Period. <clears throat> because that's called a memory marker, and she's been down that road before. She doesn't know what happened. She doesn't want to remember. She doesn't care. She doesn't want to remember any of it. All she knows is she's never going down that road again by herself. Because when she was by herself, something bizarre happened. But she does not want to remember. Because it probably didn't happen anyway. So she has like an in instinctual feeling of, of that road not to go there, maybe. Yes, it's a memory marker. You, if you go there by yourself, something's going to happen. I guess it's, uh, you know, you, uh, you can't remember the actual event, but you know something went down. And so uh, you just avoid it at all costs kind of situation. Uh, no question. Uh, it would be really, really super important to uh, to uh, pay attention to that. And, and people that have these memory markers, uh, they, they, they're they not really sure what to do, with them, but they just know that they're afraid or, or something's happened there, and they, they don't know how to, how to deal with that. So uh, what do you do? And... Uh, <clears throat> And generally, whenever people, like a, a guy came to me back in 1991, I think it was, and he says, something happened to me, I don't know what to happen, and I uh, heard about you, and I'd just like for you to work with me and find out what happened. I said, sure, have a seat. Three and a half hours later, he finally got up and said, he's going to go to the restroom. I said, sure. And uh, I played, I had, showed, had a video of the whole session, and he freaked completely out, and he said, we, we started off, uh, we were on a gold hunt. 
we're coming back through Fort Collins. We saw some bright lights down there. We thought there was a car accident because there are a lot of blue and red lights down there in the middle of the road out in the middle of nowhere. Just as we, our car slowed, our truck slowed down, and these little creatures started walking toward us, we realized that's not a police car. Hmm. <laughs> he said the next thing we noticed, the wrong guy is driving, and we're in Dalhart, Texas, hours later. And they haven't even gassed up. The entities picked the entire truck up, them included, and dropped them off in Dalhart, Texas, without using any gas, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah, we do have a caller. Says so I get them unmuted. <laughs> there we go. Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Ty. Do you have a question for uh, Daryl? Yes, I do, uh, Mr. Stem. I'm getting a bit of an echo, but um, I'm kind of curious. I'm an experiencer um, with missing time, and I notice I have, and I was just wondering, do you know what the implant is for? I don't know, did, were you able to hear I that? only heard part of your, your question. Uh, I assume that uh, you've had an, an encounter of some kind and feel like that you possibly have an implant. Uh, if that is the case, yes. uh, the first thing you should do is to see if there's any medical evidence to support your view, such as um, a, a physical examination on yourself, a, a lumps, bumps, scars, whatever, to indicate something happened, number one. Number two is uh, a, a soft tissue x-ray would be very important of the area that you suspect may have an implant. Uh, and in, the, in, in all fairness to you and to especially to the audience, uh, many abductees think they have an implant simply because they've been abducted, and I can assure most of them that is not the case. We do have abductees who do have implants. That does happen, absolutely. Done 25 surgeries so far, last one being in India for these objects uh, but many of the x-rays that i look at uh, they in fact are not implants many of them are other artifacts and, or even mistakes on the uh, x-rays but if you do have an implant a soft tissue x-ray would be the way to go to begin with some people uh go do all, all kinds of things like mris and things like that if, if in fact you check it with a magnet and you find that it, it's magnetic you definitely don't want to get <laughs> don't go to an mri because that, that MRI has got a, an unbelievably huge magnet in it, and whatever's magnetic in there is going to get pulled out rapidly. So you definitely want uh, you de in, in the course of doing this, you might want to go to a um, a chiropractor that has access to a, a um, an X-ray machine. I wouldn't mention aliens and implants and things like that. I would keep it all private and just say I bump my arm or head or whatever, wherever the area affected is. Say, I'd kind of like get a, an x-ray of that and see what you think. And if he finds anything, he's going to say, what in the world is that? And that's when you pay for the x-ray and send it to me or scan it and get a, send a copy of it to me, and I'll look at it for you and give you my opinion with our doctors. So I can tell you what their opinion is going to be, whatever my opinion is. If they don't know what an alien implant is, all they know is how to remove it and do what I tell them to do when we're doing the procedures. But they, they, they honestly don't know, but they know that it, it, they'll know that it pretty much, if they've seen anything like it, they'll, they will identify it as such, for sure. But that's the best way to begin with the process, and if you'd like to contact me directly, you can go to Alien Hunter, the site, uh, alienhunter.org, click on uh, Daryl Sims, and, or, or to the media lady, either one, it won't make any difference. It'll get forwarded to me, and I will be glad to advise you at that point and see if we can help you in some way or another. Does that answer your question, Tom? Or, or, or go ahead. <laughs> out. Sorry, say again, Ty. Sure. Is it harmful to take it out? We have, after removing uh, twenty-five of these uh, alleged implants, some of them were, and some of them weren't. Uh, no one has ever experienced any pain, death, or anything like that. Uh, everyone, with the exception of one, has all said the same thing. 
oh my God, I feel like I'm not being watched anymore or monitored. Only one of them wished he hadn't have removed the implant. And he says because he felt like he lost some type, some ability in his psychic ability. Uh, he thinks he's gained it all back now and all that, which is good news for him. But uh, the implant did not come back. Uh, we've only had one case where the so-called implant came literally was, it, we think, reinstalled. Uh, and that was a, in a, a foot case uh, it, back east. But uh, no one's reported any, no one's died or been, no, there's been no, no ill effects, none whatsoever, to answer your question, simply. Well, mine is in the foot, uh, in the sole, and I've, I've done an yes. examination and actually uh, used the radio to tune into a frequency that it seemed to be emitting. And I was wondering, uh, I was going to have it x-rayed, but for some reason I kept getting this thought in my head that I shouldn't have it x-rayed. <laughs> I wonder if that was a, a, a plant. <laughs> yes, it's a yeah. The uh, the thoughts are interesting. They're uh, they will. <laughs> this is very common in these experiences. They're real. Um, the uh, the thing you might want to do is certainly get it X-rayed. It's it's not, not going to hurt anything, and uh, see where it's located and whatever it is, and see see if it's radio opaque, see if it's metallic, see if it's uh, ferrous, if it's non-ferrous. You can test that with a very powerful. Uh, uh, mag magnet, and uh, you can find out very quickly if it's ferrous or not. Um, and we had one guy that uh, had one in his leg, and, <laughs> and my we got a film of it with my magnet hole stuck to his leg. I got one one lady. Uh, it's got implants uh, that are all. I mean, there are like a, about a half a dozen of them around her neck. And what's really weird is none of them are. Uh, None of them are ferrous metal, which means they would be magnetic, in other words. None of them are ferrous at all, but they are magnetic. Now, that was very bizarre. But if you'd like to email me and contact me, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it and uh, and, and advise you and uh, keep you posted on what we think and let some of our doctors look at some of this stuff as well. We're glad to do it. Okay, that sounds very, very good. Um, sure. I think I will schedule an X-ray. Uh, it has to be a soft tissue X-ray. That would be that would be your your best bet. Yes, uh, your doctor know what what it is. He, it, it, it's uh, basically you're looking to see if the object is radio opaque and see if it is in fact that it, it could be a chip of bone. It could be it could be metallic. It could be it could be all, any kind of thing. Uh, and what you're trying to do is eliminate some of the possibilities of what it may be. Uh, well, the, one of the first ones we found in the foot, there were three of them on top of the lady's foot, above on the top of her toe, uh, at, at the base of the toe. And what we found in that particular case is, uh, I said, well, it looks like those look like uh, uh, surgical clips from an osteotomy. And she says, uh, yeah. I said, well, and she said, I've never had a surgery in my entire life. And I said, well, that kind of changes the business, doesn't it? And so I set her up for, uh, we finally got it through everything, set her up that and hand surgery and the, the foot surgery at the same time, 1995. And the long story short, a, a scientific group came and had offered to do a scientific study. Uh, 18 scientists agreed to this and to the uh, NIDS Foundation, and they actually uh, sent the, we, uh, I picked out the implants we wanted to study, and they did a $22,000 study, a qualitative uh, analysis at Los Alamos, and a quantitative analysis at New Mexico Tech. And uh, the findings were astounding. The objects were, in fact, meteoric, a rare meteor meteorite, uh, and what I mean by that is a needle-like projection, like a, a quarter-inch-long needle-like projection in a perfect T that was there, and uh, uh, they were magnetic, and from they were from a rare meteorite. Of course, we didn't bother to tell them they came out of a human being because they'd never believed that, and the pathology was even weirder than the fact that they were meteoric in origin. I mean, even a rare meteorite. The weird thing and the, the strangest and the best part about it was that the biological covering surrounding the object 
was also impossible. But I had made these predictions of what we would find the year, a year, about a year and a half before at uh, John Muir Medical Hospital where I presented to 250 surgeons and doctors on medical complications of alleged human alien contact, specifically implants. And three doctors came on board as a result of that presentation to help us. So if I can help you in any way or advise you in any way, I would love to do it. Please email me, contact me on alienhunter.org, go there and just click on it, and we'll, uh, I answer all my emails. So if I, if I don't answer you, email me again because I didn't get it. But uh, I always answer my emails, so you can be assured of that. I will do that. Um, I have another question. Uh, it's uh, It's been several years now. Is it possible that the implants can make their way out of the body? All, it, all kinds of things are possible. The question is, is it likely? Uh, in most cases, no. It is, if they are going to disappear, it is more likely that someone's going to come and remove it. Uh, in my case, uh, in 1960, uh, I was wide awake during the event at age 12, and I remember them inserting a little shiny uh, silver spear sphere uh, into my nasal passage up behind my eye and uh, broke the bones of my nose and uh, had blood on my pillow the next morning. And um, that object was left in there. But after getting a full body x-ray later and everything, I didn't, there was no evidence that it was, that it was there. Later, uh, a, a guy called me and said he had one in the exact same place. And I said, well, I think you read my story and you made it up. And uh, they all had the old cop hat on. And uh, he sent me an x-ray, a color x-ray of his implant in his head behind his eye in the exact same place mine was, the exact same size, and the best part of it during the exact same time period that mine was. Uh, he kind of blew me out of the water. I, was, I like that. I like being impressed. What are the purposes of these implants? Oh, now you've asked the big questions. Uh, well, ultimately, ultimately, we don't know the... Since I don't know everything, I don't know all the answers, but I do know some answers. Some of the purposes of some of these objects are to uh, uh, upload and download information. But that can be done without the physical implant. Uh, but some of the implants, especially the ones that are much older, uh, seem to be designed for the purpose of uh, one of the side effects in some of these cases is uh, alteration of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, potassium. Um, that uh, that means whoever runs that show, if that is the case that's happening, and I don't know that it is with yours, but it was for some people's, it means that their mood swings, their behaviors basically are controlled by someone else. And it's up to them whether you're happy, sad, glad, or suicidal. I mean, they run your show. So um, some of these implants uh, are, and some of the information seems to be uh, designed for the purpose of, uh, of uh, uploading or uh, transmitting information one way or another, this sort of thing. Uh, and the reason I say that is because um, some of the implants... Sorry, I want to see if I can uh, do this in a different way. Um, um, let me pull up something here for you. I want to, I want to read to you real quick, if I can. Um, the implant, first of all, is a uh, best way to describe it. Is a uh, it's it's parasitic in my view. And, uh, and, and I do not, I do not, do not think that they're here to fix us and save the planet or anything like that. But that's just my personal view. Uh, whatever they're actually doing, like I don't know all the answers. I wish I did. But the fact is, they're parasitic, and the fact the fact that uh, we didn't invite them, and there they are, and uh, there's not a whole lot anybody's going to do about it. Um, so I think that it's important to uh, to think of the uh, the implant in terms of. Uh, uh, and there's different levels of this. The visible implants, which apparently you have, or they suspect that you have, uh, which is examinable, and that's really important because that'll give us uh, 
or you, uh, more the more you know about it, the better off you're going to be because you're going to know something more about what's happening. Uh, we have some forms about 20 pages long that are really worth filling out. When people fill them out, they think I'm reading their mail, so to speak. How do you know all these questions? How can you answer all this? How did you know that? Because I'm one of you. That's why. And uh, I get it. I'm, I've, I've been there. I, I, I know what's going on with a lot of these people. Uh, I don't know everything, but I do know some things. And the the thing about the implant that's, uh, I think, the, the best way to think about it is that, uh, well, I'll give, let, let me give you a quick definition. My definition of an alien implant is an implanted device or installed neurochemical or action potential process whereby the alien entity is the source and in some reflective way leaves a signature available for acceptable medical, path, uh, psychological, or scientific interpretive process. That means it can be studied. That signature will actually have actual, even profound clarity when discovered. But we have to discover it. We have to find out what it is. We have to get hold of it, so to speak, and do something with it. Alien implants, their primary use is to carry or deliver message for, from the resulting phenomena, either continuously or in short, short term, possibly through DNA or the re reproductive system, when needed, to a cell such as one in the central nervous system activated by one or more of the five senses. That's the long version. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sims, for answering my questions. And uh, I hope that uh, thanks very you. much, Space Boy and Solana. Sure. Great show tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll let you go because I know you have to go to a break. So thank you very much, <laughs> and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, since we've passed that, oh. br that break, uh, we're going to just continue on. So <clears throat> what were you going to say, Daryl? Great caller. Oh, yes. Oh, we love Ty. Yeah, He's Ty. our favorite Canadian. Yes. <clears throat> now, we do have, um, I think this may be the godfather <laughs> on hold here. Are you there, caller? Yes, I am. It is the godfather. Dino is on the line. Do you have a question or five for Daryl? <laughs> Yes, uh, hello, Daryl. My name is Dino. Uh, uh, I want to say first off a little bit about my background. I think you would have gotten along fine with my father, who was a small-time cattle rancher in Northern California. Um, I think you would be a very intelligent guy. I think you would have enjoyed it. Now, when I listen to you, I've listened to you a couple of times. I've never met you. been lucky enough in that I have never had a personal experience even you know, I know astronomy, but I've never seen anything I couldn't explain in the sky, telescope, or visually. <clears throat> um, the other thing is that uh, uh, a lot of the things you bring up are kind of, you know, I started on this casually years ago because I loved science fiction, you know, 25, 30 years ago. <clears throat> uh, got more interested in it going to a few things 15 years ago, and in the last five years I've become much more serious about uh, exploring all the options of all the people in this field, and you are unique in many ways in that you're telling us what you've told us tonight and what I've heard on other programs, uh, that that they're not all uh, encompassing God-like creatures, that they are not as advanced, and, and that's interesting to me, and I have to take it on faith. Um, the only time that I ever had uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be in a room alone with Whitley and with also with Travis on two occasions, um, and, and I believe them, and that's why I continue to research this field and believe a lot of the things through people like yourself who I do believe. Um, the only time I've had an experience where I felt that something wasn't right was uh, back in the 80s walking in a remote area with an American Indian friend of mine in Big Sur, California, up back in the mountains. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, he was a little slower than me. I'm kind of a tall, lanky guy, and, and I told him, you're pretty slow for an Indian, you know. <laughs> and he, and he, so we said we'd catch up later down this 12-mile trail. Well, on the way back, it was just before it got dark, and there was one area, I don't know if you know the Big Sur area of California, but uh, Central California, but it's... Uh, 
these trails are maybe you know 18 inches wide and they're very steep full of <clears throat> it's like a rainforest all the way down into gullies that you can't see whether it's a gully or a stream and on the other side they go up at about 40 degrees god knows how high so we were headed back uh, from being out 12 miles out from highway one and as i <clears throat> came around this one bend in the trail and you didn't it was middle of the week when most of the tourists don't come that far so you only passed a couple of people on the trail all morning or all evening and when i went into this little bend area um, I really did have a feeling, and I'm a city boy mostly, but I would spend summers at my dad's ranch, and I had a weird feeling it was being watched. And, I mean, this was out pretty far out, you know, for California. It's a pretty remote, rugged area. And so I just kind of hurried up. I just I felt odd. I wasn't supposed to have <clears throat> a pistol with me, you know, there was a national park or a state park or something. But I had one, but I, I really had thought, gee, I bet better defend myself. But I just ran, ch- trotted down the trail and got around, and everything felt good. Well, around dark, my, my friend came in, my American Indian friend, and I said, what took you so long? And we were talking about the day. And I mentioned this little area where we kind of went into the mountain and came out again on the trail, and he said he'd had the same feeling, too, that on the back of his neck <clears throat> something had stood up, you know, the hair had stood up. And I said, what do you think that was? And he goes, oh, probably a wild animal scoping us out. I asked other people uh, years later, and they said, well, there used to be a lot of Vietnam vets that kind of went, you know, wanted to get away from it all, and they were probably living back there and saw you walking by. Um I didn't miss any time. I mean, I know that because he came in a half hour after me, and he was about a half hour back on the trail. So I don't know what I could ask you, except that it's very unique and that you're telling me that that realistically if I had to and I couldn't use some kind of martial art or or, or the the mind training that you talk about, that I could pull out a, a firearm like Phil Snyder did and actually shoot one of these beings if I had to defend myself? It, the 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 thing that the 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 problem that uh, that I have with a number of investigators is they tell me what we, what can't be done. I said, how do you know that? Well, because the literature. I said, first of all, I said, listen to me carefully. I said, have you ever seen an alien? No. Have you ever seen a UFO? No. Have you ever had a close encounter of any kind? No. Don't tell me about aliens because you don't know anything about them. The only thing you know is what you read in a book, and you hope and pray that what you read was, in fact, correct. Or the people didn't lie or stretch the truth, or you're reading someone's screen memory. You actually don't know. You can't be used in the court of law because you weren't there. You don't know. That's so. When you do find out and you do check with witnesses where things like this can happen, I said, here's the deal. If that entity, I said, for, they said, well, I saw... A, I saw this light, and it was doing this. I said, okay, there's a small light that was coming towards you, whatever. I said, okay. Was it fuzzy-edged or was it hard-edged? What does that have to think? I said, answer the frickin' question. <laughs> was it hard-edged or was it fuzzy? Well, it was fuzzy. I said, that's an entity in transport. What? I said, he's either coming towards you or he's leaving. But if he's there in 3D, he's vulnerable. That's why the ship crashed in Roswell. Notice that the bodies were dead except for one or two of them, according to the stories. The fact is they were in 3D when that thing hit the ground. If they had been in a light form, it would have done something different. They probably would have gone into the ground and not even had a problem. Somebody didn't get everything switched off in time, and it crashed. In my opinion, that was done on purpose, but that's neither here nor there. I, I, I just have a different view about Roswell. I think of Roswell with an intelligence hat on, not with not with my UFO hat. My UFO hat's been fooled before. I don't like that. My intelligence hat hasn't been fooled at all. I like that better. So the bottom line is, to answer your question, if you're out there and you've got a gun and that thing is there and you shoot at it, uh, and I'll give you one quick example. A guy I met in... Uh, uh, he came and met me in uh, Denver at a conference, and uh, he said, I just want to ask you one question. He said, I don't believe in any of this stuff. I think everybody's crazy. And I said, okay, fair enough. He said, but I am a site, a site hunter. I said, I know exactly what you are. He said, I came up over this ridge, 
He said, I swear, swear to God, hand to God. He said, there was a seven-foot praying mantis on the top of the hill there. And he said, and I and raised the gun up instantly and fired. And I said, I heard, uh, as I shot, I hear, I actually heard the bullet hit him. And it, poof, and then he disappeared. He said, what do you think happened? And I said, well, if that all, all things being true, what you said, I said, what happened is you shot uh, a praying mantis entity. And I said, they probably were... Uh, the ship was in line with you, but you're down below the ridge. They can't see you. <clears throat> Just you come up over the ridge, they see you at the wrong time. By the time you fire and hit him, I said, by the time they beamed that guy on board the craft, he had a hole in him about the size of your fist. You got him. You see, he wasn't well, in 3D. That, that, he was in 3D at that time. That's just, that's the way it works. Why did the alien was scared of me in the desert when I had my little twenty two rifle? I can hear him thinking he thought I was going to shoot him. I wasn't. But that's not the point. He thought I was, and he was afraid for his little life. So, yes, they're vulnerable. Yeah, and, and the Doppler effect. I mean, I've studied physics. That's our friend. That makes a lot of sense about Roswell. If a train's coming towards you, it sounds higher. If it's leaving you, it sounds lower pitched. And uh, I wanted one more thing to ask you, if I may. Uh, I, someday I hope to meet you. If you ever come to Northern California, I could tell you a few more things. But the first time I heard any kind of a story, I was 12 years old. We were running a dude string up in the Sierras during the summer for tourists way up on some Forest Service land. And, the, and um, my father told me about some guys in town. It was a little town called La Porte, California an old mining town, and he said these two guys, this was back in the late 50s, early 60s, would start a fight with you if you went into a bar where they were hanging out because when they were there in the 50s uh, mining, <clears throat> you know, just two old guys just hanging out, and they said one night they got awakened by a light, and they looked up over the ridge. They were pretty high up on a ridge, and they looked over down into the creek, and they said here was this saucer-shaped craft with three tripods, landing by the creek a little ladder came down and three little short guys came out with a bucket and they went to the creek and they picked up water and they climbed back up the ladder and went and the craft took off and they were this was the late 50s early 60s he said they were just people would laugh at them and bug them and they stayed living up there and he said they'd fight you if you brought it up in a bar because they'd been tortured so much but that would tell me something if those guys had no reason you know, oh, they were drunk. No, these guys that you know were guys that lived out in the woods and all. That would show you how primitive that craft must have been. That they had to get out and get water, I presume, for the hydrogen from everything I've learned to, to activate their craft. They had to go with a buck to get a bucket of water. So how advanced? Thank is you. That? Brilliant, brilliant observation on your part. Brilliant. Somebody needs to hire you as an investigator. Well, someday maybe. I'm getting ready to retire soon, and, and I might. <laughs> I wish, you, know, you have an interesting life. I wish that I was financially independent enough that I could stop working today. I'm going to wait another year or two. Who knows? But where I live now, uh, I'm up on a hill, and uh, there's an old, it was one of the smallest Air Force stations I found out when I moved up here <clears throat> in the whole country because during the war it looked over the Pacific and it looked over the, the, they had radar there, and I'm sure there are underground facilities there. They decommissioned it years ago. <clears throat> but a uh, mm -hmm. funny thing happened. A couple of years ago, I was just doing some habitat restoration volunteer work up on the mountain up there, and a woman that was another volunteer said, you know that gate up there that says no trans, no, she goes, a couple of my girlfriends were hiking over the mountain, thought they'd take a shortcut, and the gate's just a chain link, you can kind of squeeze through it. And she goes, they're just two ladies taking a day hike. And a guy came out with an automatic rifle, no uniform or anything, and said, you can't be up here. And this is supposed mm -hmm. to be a decommissioned area, you know, that, <clears throat> that the water it. company, or I think the water, it's their land. And so that, that opened me up to, gee, what, what might be going on up there with a guy with an automatic weapon is guarding it for two women hikers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were, you were right on target. When we were in uh, Sedona, uh, they they we we were with the guy, and he was supposed to show us this underground base. And I knew he didn't know where it was at, even if there was one there. 
And uh, anyway, long story short, is I said, where is it? And he said, well, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well, we came right where you said. You got $100,000 of equipment and people out here and four investigators. Where is the underground base? Uh, well, it's uh, down there somewhere. And we went down there. I said, well, now where? Uh, they must have covered it up. Well, you don't know. You don't know. Where. You, you never, probably never knew. I said, okay. And we got on top of the mountain, and finally the, uh, one of the producers and the director came over and said, Daryl, your ex-intelligence, where in the world would an underground base be out here? And I said, well, how in the world would I know something like that? And he said, would you please answer the question? And we're standing on top of a mountain. You can see Sedona off to the left, way out there. Just the lights way out there. And a little town about 10 miles away, the other over there. And right down in front of the mountain, there's this, this business. It's a concrete plant. All lit up. I mean, it's the biggest concrete plant I've ever seen in my life. And I used to be in construction, doing commercial construction on Holloman Air Force Base, White Sands Missile Range, places like that. I mean, I, I know what I'm doing. And I said, if I were going to have an underground base or an operation, I would put it right there. He said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, it makes all the sense in the world. He said, what do you mean? I said, well... I'm not saying that's what it is. You just asked the question. I said, look at what you're looking at down there. He said, well, it's a well-lit, uh, not very secret, is it? And I said, that's the whole point. It's hidden plain sight. He said, what do you mean? I said, look how many trucks they got down here. I said, I've never seen a concrete company so big. He said, what's wrong with that? I said, well, a couple of problems. Number one is... Uh, since we've been up here all day, have you even seen one truck move or do anything? No. So we've got a lot of people down there with a bunch of trucks and nobody's doing any work. Where's the concrete? I said, this is out in the middle of nowhere. Where in the world do you suppose they're going to be hauling concrete to? So what do you mean? I said, listen to me. If you pour government concrete or certain kinds of specialized concrete... It has to be a certain temperature, and it has to be in that truck only so long, or it's no of no use anymore. Oh, so where do you think they're? What do you think they're doing down there? Making concrete or doing something else? I said that thing's lit up like a tiny city. It's so huge, and we've not seen anybody come or go since we've been here, and that thing is huge. You might want to take your cameras down there and ask some questions, but I'll bet you you get kicked off the property real quick. Well, I, I just I have to hear one of your presentations. I hope you can come to Northern Cal <clears throat> sometime. Well, and th there's another way to do that. If uh, you go to the website, just email me, and uh, I've even got one of my one of my very best presentation, and it's 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 professionally done. Um, because I didn't speak. No, I'm just kidding. I, may, I actually did it. Uh, it's a, about an hour and a half long, and it is. Uh, it's. I have it on CD, and uh, that's available if you're interested. And it, it has got stuff on it you will not find anywhere. I guarantee it. Evidence you won't believe. Okay. Well, I, I thank you. And Space Boy and Serlana, as usual, have been very generous, letting me have all this time. Uh, very interesting night. Very interesting. I, I've uh, hung on a lot of your words, even though I've heard you before. Well, I thank you so much. You're, uh, you're, uh, they're, they're incredible, and uh, that's one of the best groups I've ever been on the radio. Uh, they, I'm telling you, these two are wonderful people. Oh, you're going to make my head explode. <laughs> I wonder if that's just because we're in Houston. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. That's going to cost me another 20. Maybe someday I'll meet you. Uh, I've already met Space Boy and Sarwana, and that was amazing. So I'll meet you someday, Daryl, and keep telling us, oh, by the way, uh, what, what what's the best caliber to use <laughs> if I need it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> UV bullets. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, he, he, he hung up. Kidding. All right. Well, mm -hmm. so Daryl, you know, we're down to the last little bit, and I always like to reserve this last little bit. For you know, social media uh, things, you know, your books, you know, and things. you're going to UFO Congress, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, just let us know uh, all the stuff you need uh, to make sure our audience knows how to get a hold of you and all okay. that good stuff. Sure, 
uh, be glad to do that and give my last word if we, if we can. Oh, if we oh have time. most definitely. Uh, number one, I'll be at the Alien Expo on May 26th through the 28th and doing some amazing stuff up there. It's a massive conference. You'll love it. Just go, cut, if you email me, go to alienhunter.org and click on Daryl Sands, and I'll send you all kinds of free stuff, fun stuff to uh, you can look at and check out. And, and I have a couple of books, on one on implants and one on the how to find evidence. And I, I designed the books not to be entertaining, but to be practical. Uh, the book on evidence is how you can find your own evidence. You don't need me. You just need to know, know how to do what I do. And it works for you just like it does for me. But I'm at the May 8th, 26th and through the 28th at the Sheridan in Dallas. If you're wanting to know about that, I'll be glad to send that information to you. It's also on my fa- Facebook site, uh, The Alien Hunter, Daryl Sims, uh, fa- on Facebook. And uh, uh, we're also on meetup.com. At, uh, for those of you who have an interest on Houston UFO Network, uh, we're right here in Houston. You're welcome to come visit us. And... Um, uh, or you can go to the website, alienhunter.org, and simply click on Daryl Sims, and uh, you can email me and get in touch with me right off the bat. But the bottom line is that what I'd like to say to your audience in closing is simply that the map is not the territory. Maps are just maps. They're not the territory. They never are. If you're holding a map, you're not in the territory. You're looking at a, a representation of the territory. But if the maps are accurate, they can give you an accurate description of what the real territory might actually look like or it may even be. My point is that crop circles are not the territory. They may just be maps. But you have to ask the big question, whose maps? Implants are not the territory. They may just be maps. UFOs are not the territory. They also may be just maps. In other words, the menu is not the meal. I mean, the menu may look like the meal, but I can assure you in some of the restaurants I've been in, I'd rather eat the menu than some of the food I've eaten. But the fact is, the menu is still not the meal. The waiter is not the chef. This is a common error of abductees. They actually think the guy who picked them up is the guy in charge. He isn't. Mm-hmm. He is not in charge. He's just, he may be a map himself or a menu, or something else. He's just a usual suspect who's not... He, he just part of the program setting you up. That's the bottom line. That is it. And if you're going to help people and do anything in this business, in my opinion, uh, Jesus Christ made a wonderful statement that I love. He said, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. I don't think you have to die for somebody to prove your point, but I think you should be able to lay your life down for something that's important and bigger and other than you. And anybody that's been in the military and volunteered, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the only two people that ever took care of anybody for free. Well put. Um, so, Daryl, uh, don't go anywhere. Just stay right there. Um, we reached the end, our friends. Uh, real quick housekeeping. Next week we have... Um, Preston did it. Yes, Preston did it. We're going to be talking about the moon, and uh, that'll what's be what's up with that. What's up with the, what's up with that? <laughs> and so that'll be interesting to talk to him. Uh, it's been a while since we talked to him last year. Uh, we'll catch up on some of his things, but uh, Preston did it. Will be great. We'll have him on uh, on the 18th. We have Ken, the crypto guy. That'll be fun. Um, Sir Lana wants to talk about his owl. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about owls. <laughs> I have nothing to say about them. I just like them. And, of course, we'll round out this uh, this month where we'll have a discussion about Linda Malta Howe. So join us next week, my friends, on Space Boy Universe and explore with Space Boy and Solana. So say goodnight, Solana. Goodnight, Solana. Space Boy Universe is hosted by Space Boy and Sir Lana. Executive producer is Sir Lana. Social media producer is Dennis Koch. Associate producer is Lee Ann Cordes. Music production is Space Boy of SpaceBoyMusic.com. Special thanks goes out to Lee Ann K, K28, Mark S, and Bob N. This has been a Space Boy Universe production. 
support the universe by exploring Space Boy Universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana. Sweet Dreams Space Cadets.